What's going on, Jackson here, and in this video, I'm gonna bring you the only cold email related video that you're gonna need to watch in 2024, okay? So I've prepared a 36 page document covering everything from A to Z that you need to know to get results with cold email in 2024, okay? Um, and if you're not aware, there's been some very big changes in terms of how you need to be going about cold email in 2024. Um, and you know, that leads us right into the introduction of the document, which is, in 2023, about 11 months ago, I made one of my first videos on cold email. You know, it performed pretty well, right? About 10,000 views. Uh, but more importantly than, you know, the video performing well, I received more messages than I can count of agency owners telling me that they used the video to land their next handful of clients, right? Uh, and so you can even check out the comments, like, after months of trying to get a positive response, I got one the first day of trying this method. Uh, and so, you know, I had a ton of people messaging me saying they used it to land their first client. And, you know, despite this, if you were to go watch that same exact video that, you know, people are leaving those comments and that people use to get results, you would probably get terrible results. Okay. Um, and why? because cold email is always changing, okay? And more importantly, there's been some massive changes recently. Um, and so you haven't heard, you know, Google Domains bought Squarespace, G Suite is about to drop, you know, the, the cold email killer update of the year. Uh, and so we'll kind of talk about that in a moment, but the goal of this video, and it's gonna be a long one, right? Obviously, I don't know how long it's gonna be right now. Uh, you, as the viewer watching this in the future, is gonna be able to see that. Um, and so it's gonna be a long one, but the goal is that you have an updated guide to succeeding with cold email in 2024 to where you can literally just use this document, which by the way, will be available in the description, where you can just use this document in this video and you don't really need to you know, spend time watching anything else. That's the goal, okay? Um, and so to start it off, I kinda wanna talk about cold email versus paid ads because you know our main service at lead odyssey is literally running paid ads for agency owners right um and i would still advocate that every single agency owner depending on the niche obviously has some sort of cold outbound in their client acquisition okay cold outbound whether that's cold email whether that's cold linkedin whether that's cold ig cold facebook team of sdrs i would really advocate for some type of cold outbound okay especially if you're in a market where prospects self advertise their profession along with their contact information, example, real estate agents, lawyers, insurance agents, uh, you know, home improvement company founders, if you're in a niche like that, where contact information is publicly advertised, cold outbound absolutely rips, okay, because it's very easy to acquire leads, okay. However, you know, all this being said, I have to make, you know, I have to mention this before we start talking about cold email is if you have at least $30 per day, make sure to start running paid ads, okay? This is literally a cold email video and I'm telling you to run paid ads. If you have at least $30 per day, literally like $900 a month, just start running paid ads. Even if you're doing cold email, on top of the cold email, just start running paid ads, okay? Trust me, just do it. Um, and ignore most of the cold email bros. So the lead gen agency owners who will try and tell you that cold email is better than paid ads and blah, 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 right? Okay, so if you have $30 per day, regardless of this video, still use cold email, but please start running ads, okay? I just have to say that. Um, and so there's only gonna be a few scenarios where you should rely on cold email over paid ads. And so the first one is gonna be if your total addressable market TAM is extremely small, right? So there's some TAMs where like, it's just such a small size that, you know, it's not broad enough for paid ads to really work effectively. Uh, or two, you're in corporate or enterprise sales and the ICP that you're trying to target, they're just not gonna be reachable through paid ads, right? And it's gonna be a lot easier to reach them inside of their inbox or inside of their LinkedIn inbox as well, okay? Um, and so again, I just wanna say that like, you know, yes, cold email is amazing and we're gonna talk about why it's amazing along on how to crush with cold email, but if you have $30 per day and you're not in that situation, just don't listen to the cold email agency owners who are like, yeah, paid cold email is better than paid ads. Just use both of them in your client acquisition, right? But if you look at all the top guys in the space, again, this depends on your niche, obviously, but if you look at most of the top guys in the space in your niche, uh, if you're an agency owner that, again, doesn't have a very small TAM or you're not in corporate or enterprise sales, look at the top guys and they're probably very heavily reliant on paid acquisition, okay? But that being said, we still want cold outbound as part of our acquisition and I'll talk about that right now, okay? But for most people watching this, wanting to scale past 100K per month, Paid ads should such will be your main channel, but I would still include cold email on the side, okay? I just have to say this. So, and for those of you watching this who is currently spending a large amount on paid ads, 
I would still recommend building a cold email or outbound infrastructure, right? So just look at some of the top guys in the space. Cole Gordon, founder of Closers.io. Last time I checked, they're doing $4 million per month. Has a cold email department adding an additional 300K per month in revenue, even though he spends half a million dollars a month on paid ads, right? Um, so Cole Gordon, one of the clear market leaders in you know the B2B sales space is, you know, in coaching and consulting, is doing $4 million a month but he still has a cold email department, or sorry, cold outbound department, adding an additional 300K per month, even though he's spending half a million dollars a month on paid ads, okay? Uh, look at Tanner Chedester, founder of Elite CEOs, $70 million company, right? Uh, has an outbound department built around cold email and cold calling, even though he's spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads every month, okay? Um, and I, you know, the reason that he built a cold outbound department is because he reached a point where, from what I've heard, paid ads had reached a point of diminishing returns, where it was hard to scale up the ad spend, bring on more setters, etc., and make it work at that very large scale of hundreds of thousands of dollars in ad spend every month. So the way that he kind of alleviated that constraint was building an outbound department, okay? Uh, and he actually talked a lot about this. He did an interview with Ravi Abuvalo with Scaling the Systems. Highly recommend checking that out. And he talked all about kind of why he built an outbound department. Um, but if you look at a lot of these big guys, Cole Gordon, Tanner Chedester, uh, and the next example we're about to get into, which is Alex Ramosi. Obviously, you've heard of him, founder of Gym Launch. $90 million in two years with Gym Launch. Uh, he built an outbound department around cold email and cold calling. And, you know, this department saved his business during COVID, right? So if you read $100 million leads, he talked about building that outbound department, okay? Um, and from what I've heard, at one point, Gym Launch was 70% outbound and 30% paid ads, okay? So if you're watching this video and you're spending more than five to $10,000 a month on paid ads, it still makes sense to build a cold outbound department, okay? And look at all the biggest guys in the space and they're actually doing this, okay? But again, you don't wanna only do cold email if you're in a niche where you can benefit from paid ads. If you have $30 per day, get started on paid ads. But even if you're spending quite a bit on ads and you know, for whatever reason you're watching this video, um, please build an outbound department as well, okay? It's 100% worth it. Um, and so, Again, before we kind of get into the nuggets, you know, it's important that you understand why you need to focus on cold email in 2024 so that you actually take it seriously, okay? Um, and so the first one is just gonna be a low cost per acquisition. So like a basic cold email infrastructure only costs $200 or $400 per month to run. And that's to, you know, obviously that price goes up the more emails that you wanna send, but a very basic cold email infrastructure, it only costs $200 or $400 a month, right? So that's about half of the minimum needed to get results of paid ads, okay? And that $200 or $400 per month is gonna get you anywhere from two to five clients every month assuming that you follow all the principles in this video and that you don't suck at sales, okay? Um, if you follow everything in this video and you don't suck at sales, you can onboard two to five clients every month for just $400 a month in software costs, okay? Um, and so that's one of the beautiful things about cold email is it's an absolutely insane cost per acquisition. And what this does is it makes funding slash scaling your paid ads campaign easier, okay? So when you have that on the side, like paid ads can be volatile, and if you have a cold email on the side, just predictably bringing in an extra two to five clients, keep in mind, like that's not necessarily a lot of clients. That's with like very low sending volume, just $200 or $400 per month. But the beautiful thing about cold email is you can scale it up. And so if you spend $800 a month on cold email and buy more domains, you could be onboarding five to 10 clients every month from cold email. Okay. Um, but you know, what this does is if you don't have enough cash flow to run paid ads, Cold email is going to be the easiest way to get that cash flow. And if you are running paid ads, this is just going to make funding them easier if you have cold email on the side as another acquisition channel. OK, um, the next one is going to be predictability. So like, you know, typically cold outbound is actually far more predictable and less volatile than paid ads. So like, you know, Cole Gordon, Alex Ramosi, Tanner Chedester, like a lot of these guys are building outbound departments because they're so much more predictable than paid ads. Right. So, again, I'm a huge proponent of paid ads and cold email. But from the data that we've seen and the data that I've heard is cold outbound actually becomes a lot more predictable. OK, so typically cold outbound is going to be less volatile than paid ads. Right. Um, so, for example, it was just December. Right. Uh, it's quarter four. Everyone's trying to get that tax right off. They're pumping money into ad spend. You know, again, trying to get that end of the year tax right off. Uh, all the e-commerce brands are trying to, you know, quarter four hit the hit the projections. Uh, it's Christmas. It's the holidays. It's Black Friday. It's Cyber Monday. You know, they're all trying to pump out ads like crazy. And when more people are putting ads, you know, or more people are putting ad spend into Facebook ads, 
you know, your CPMs are going to increase, right? And so Facebook ads, and that's just one example, but Facebook ads are typically going to be more volatile, right? Like your cost per lead, your cost per book call, your cost per acquisition is subject to fluctuate throughout month to month. We're cold outbound. It's like, if you have a 0.5% ABR appointment booking rate, you can trust it's likely going to stay around 0.5% as time goes on and you scale. Obviously, sometimes the cold outbound like numbers deviate as you scale. And so like, if you have a 0.5% conversion rate and you're sending a thousand emails per day, but you go up to, you know, 3000 emails per day, it might, it's subject to change a little bit. But to be honest with you, like one of the amazing things about cold outbound, specifically cold email, it's just so predictable. Like it, whatever conversion rate you get, typically it's going to be very easy to keep that conversion rate. Um, assuming that you're taking care of the domains, you're getting new ones, you're following best deliverability practices, etc. Uh, it's very predictable. Okay. And because of that, again, it makes it easy to, to make decisions. And it's just nice to have that predictability where like paid ads are just going to be a little more volatile, right? Um, so that predictability is very nice with cold outbound. So that's one of the very obvious benefits. Uh, the other one is going to be validation. So like, you know, cold email is a great channel to validate offers, validate VSLs before taking them to mass market with paid ads, right? Um, and so like VSLs, like I see a lot of people just send traffic to a calendar. But if you look at a lot of the top guys, you know, like Cole Gordon, you know, Alex Ramosi, uh, Jim Launch used to have a VSL funnel. Now they're doing kind of like a lead magnet. Um, but you know, a lot of them are using VSLs, right? And I see a lot of people on the lower end who don't use VSLs. And it's just because their, their VSLs weren't working because like the copywriting was terrible, or they just didn't resonate with the market, right? Um, and because of this, they turned it off and they didn't, you know, they didn't keep testing different VSLs because it obviously costs money, right? But with cold email, you can test new offers and you can test new VSLs for free, right? Not for free, but for very low software costs. And this is incredibly helpful, right? If you don't have a large, large ad ad budget and you want to validate an offer, validate a VSL before taking it to paid ads, cold email is a great vehicle to do that. Okay. Um, and so this is incredibly helpful if you don't have hundreds of dollars per day to spend on paid ads and test new offers and test new VSLs. Okay. Um, so it becomes this place where you can validate offers, validate VSLs and save money. Um, and so once you validate them through cold email, which is relatively cheap, you can then take it to paid ads without having to spend a ton of extra money trying to figure out what offers are going to cook and what VSLs are going to work. work okay. Um, and then the other thing is just scale ability. So like cold email is one of the easiest cold outbound channels to scale and manage, right? So like, yeah, you have cold calling and that's, you know, that's a great channel, but it's hard to scale. You have to bring on more SDRs. You know, everyone knows that hiring an SDR, like out of five people that you bring on, like one of them is actually going to be good. Um, and so, you know, you have to scale up a team of, of SDRs, you have to manage them, etc. cetera. Um, and so cold email, you just have these inboxes. It's like all, you, it's literally scalable, meaning all you have to do is buy more inboxes and scrape more leads and increase your volume along with your results. Okay. Um, and with the right SOPs and the, and the right hires, the entire system can be hundred percent automated. Okay. So cold email is very scalable. And like, if you're in a market like real estate agents, oh my gosh, like, like when we used to have a cold email offer, like we have a client in the real estate niche, he was sending like, he wasn't even sending that many emails and he was booking like 40 calls a month. Right. But there's like 3 million agents. If he wanted to scale that up like five X, he could easily do that. And the leads are going to be there. Okay. So like you can book a, like, you know, I know people doing crazy volume, three to 5,000 cold emails per day. And like, if you have a very big TAM, it's like, it's going to be very easy to do that because there's a ton of leads. Right. Um, and so like cold email is insanely scalable. I don't know why, but a lot of people will get in a cold email and they'll see really good results and they just never really scale. But it's like, that's what cold email is meant for. Right. As soon as you start getting good results, buy more domains, buy more inboxes and increase your sending volume along with your results. Okay. Um, and so it's very scalable versus other outbound channels like cold calling. You have to build a team of SDRs. You have to manage them morning meetings, you know, end of day SOPs. Uh, you have to fire people where like cold email is, is it's very easy to scale. Just get more domains, get more inboxes. All you need is like one campaign manager, maybe one SDR to go along and, and call the cold email leads who don't book a call. Um, but it's very easy to scale. Okay. Very easy to scale. You just have to do it. Right. Um, and so I don't see it. And the reason I say you just have to do it is because I see a lot of people, they start cold email, they get good results and they just take forever to buy more domains. If it's working, buy more domains, double your results. Okay. Um, and so the other one is going to be LLAs. So lookalike audiences. So 
you know, a cold email, you get a very high throughput of positive responses or interested leads. And essentially what that means is it's a lead who's in your ICP, if you use the right lead scraping methods, and they've shown interest in your offer, right? So like your offer is in your cold email. If someone replies positively to that cold email, they're directly expressing interest in your offer. This is good data to have because the, you can then create a lookalike audience on Facebook using the list of interested leads, right? So, you know, something we, you know, something I see people do a lot, we also do it occasionally is going to a lead source like Apollo and, you know, scraping like 5,000 real estate agents, uploading it to Facebook ads, say, hey, make a one, two, three, four, 5% lookalike audience of this, you know, of these leads and you get a really t uh, high performing ad set, okay? But what's even better than that is actually uploading those leads to a cold email campaign and then all the ones who express interest in your offer taking them and uploading those leads to Facebook and saying, hey, look for more people showing similar behaviors to this list of people who is in my ideal client profile and has directly expressed interest in my offer, okay? Um, and so cold email, again, it can work in conjunction with paid ads where it allows you to build these very powerful ad sets with very, 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 very good lookalike audiences, okay? Uh, and then again, Facebook uses that data to find more people who are also likely to be interested in your offer and show your ads to them, okay? Um, and so you can build really good LLAs using cold email. Um, and having a list of leads who engage with your offer is extremely powerful data to have, okay? Um, and so one more benefit before we kind of get into, you know, all the nuggets is one of the drawbacks of paid ads is a lower calendar calendar efficiency. Okay. So what calendar efficiency means is, you know, what percentage of the people on the calendar that are showing you know, what percentage of the slots on the calendar are going to show up and are qualified, right? So like once you start booking, you know, you as the founder, you can realistically only take about 50 to 100 calls per month, meaning that there is a limited availability on your calendar of 50 to 100. And no, and then you know, in, or, and once you're booking more than 100 calls per month, 50 100 calls per month, you have to bring on a closer to alleviate that constraint and get more availability. Okay. Um, and so when you bring on a closer, Look, that closer can probably only take about 100 calls per month and you want those 100 calls to have the highest percentage of show ups and, and you know, qualified leads, right? And if that percentage drops, the closer churns, but also, you know, there's limited availability. So we want to save those slots for the leads who are most likely to show up and are most likely to be qualified, okay? And typically with paid ads, you have a lower show rate, you know, sometimes you can have a lower qualification rate, meaning you know, you, this leads you to having to create an application grading system. And then you actually have to spend more on paid ads than you initially thought to get the lowest percentage of no shows and unqualified leads or else your sales team will end up churning. Okay. And so based on our data across 20 plus cold email campaigns in various industries, typically meetings booked via cold email are more likely to show up and to be qualified, okay? Leading to a higher calendar efficiency, okay? So paid ads, you have to build an application grading system. Literally, you have to if you wanna scale them. Um, but with cold email, you know, there's a higher calendar efficiency, meaning the show rates are better and typically the leads are more qualified, right? Um, and so typically, you know, again, this gives you a higher calendar efficiency, which your sales team is gonna love, okay? Um, and so that's really, kind of, you know, benefits, maybe you knew some of them, maybe you didn't. Uh, so without wasting any more time, let's get into the actual cold email masterclass. Okay. Um, and so part one is obviously going to be the technical setup. Even if you think that you're familiar with setting up cold email, you know, inboxes and domains, I would still listen through this part because again, a lot's changed in 2024. Uh, and so the first step is obviously buying burner domains. Okay. So if you came to me, you said, Hey, Jackson, I'm trying to build a cold email system in 2023. I would have told you to always buy your domains from Google, okay? However, things have changed. Google has sold all of their domains to Squarespace, who is very anti-cold email, and as a result, you will now have terrible deliverability, okay? And so if you bought domains from Google a while ago, they're now gonna have terrible deliverability because now they're owned by Squarespace, who is very anti-cold email. So if they detect cold email related activity under their domains, you know, you're gonna get poor deliverability, okay? Um, and so even if you bought domains from Google a while ago, they're no longer good, okay? And if you go to buy them today, they're also no longer good, okay? So all of Google's domains are now owned by Squarespace. Squarespace is very anti-cold email. That's really all you have to know. So don't buy your domains from Google, don't buy your domains from Squarespace. And if you currently have domains from Google, 
you don't want to use them. Okay. Um, and so after consulting with multiple cold email specialists, the best place to buy domains in 2024. So like I've talked to a couple of the very big lead gen agency owners, pretty much all of them are getting their domains from GoDaddy or pork bun. Okay. Um, and so you know, you have to be very careful where you buy your domains. Yes, you could get cheap domains elsewhere. Typically, they're going to come pre blacklisted. And so you want to get them from a reputable source, it's very important that you do this. And so again, from what I've seen and what we've you know been experimenting with, the two best places to get domains in 2024 at this moment is going to be GoDaddy or Pork Pork Bun. Okay, and I personally prefer GoDaddy at the moment because they have a deal where you can add email users to the domains at a 60% discount, and we'll touch more on this later. Okay, so I personally prefer GoDaddy. You, these are the two places that I would get domains from in 2024, GoDaddy, Pork Bun, nowhere else, okay? Uh, I personally prefer GoDaddy, and we'll talk about why a little bit later, okay? Um, and so these are the only two places you wanna get domains, and I would recommend getting a minimum of 10 burner domains to get started. 10 domains is enough to send 600 to 900 cold emails per day. And if you're serious about scaling and you have the capital, right? So if you're trying to build a true outbound department, I would purchase a minimum of 30 burner domains. Volume is going to be key in 2024. Uh, a lot, you know, cold email, it, there's a very easy, you know, there's a very low barrier to entry now in cold email, like softwares like Smart Lead and Instantly, they've made it very easy for anyone could, to get started at cold email. And so more and more people are starting to send cold emails. And the only way to combat that, unfortunately, is just sending more cold emails, okay? Um, and so volume is really gonna be key in 2024. And if you have the money, I would just go full send, get 30 burner domains, okay? Again, it's just gonna make it unnecessary. It's gonna make it unreasonable that you don't see success, okay? If you have the money, purchase 30, uh, purchase 30 burner domains. Okay. Um, and so 30 domains is going to be enough to send 1200 to 1800 cold emails per day. Okay. Um, and in order to figure out how many domains you need to hit your desired sending volume, use the math math equation below. Okay. So one domain equals two to three users, AKA inboxes, and one user can send about 25 to 30 cold emails per day. So you, knowing that you can do the math on how many domains you need to hit your desired sending volume. Um, and PSA, cold email is not gonna be worth it unless you plan to send at least 500 cold emails per day at a minimum, okay? So to send about 500, you're gonna need, uh, I think like 15, 17 inboxes slash users, okay? But again, I would I would really just recommend going full send. If you can afford it, get 30 burner domains. Uh, just trust me, okay? Um, and don't overthink the burner domain names. They're all gonna forward to your website anyways, okay? Um, and so, and by the way, you always wanna buy .com domains. Even if your main domain uses .io like ours does, everyone's buying .io domains in 2024. So I just wanna say this, like no matter what your real domain is, for your burner domains, they need to be .com for deliverability and open rate purposes, okay? Um, and so only use .com domains, avoid any numbers or dashes, okay? So make them really simple. For example, our company name is Lead Odyssey and we bought the following domains. GetLeadOdyssey.com, TryLeadOdyssey.com, RunLeadOdyssey.com, MyLeadOdyssey.com, EmailLeadOdyssey.com, right? Um, and so you just put all these different words in front of your company name and you don't include any numbers, you don't include any dashes, and you always get a .com domain, okay? Um, and so you literally just put random words like get, try, run, my, email, go, uh, you know, mail, like you can do all these different things. Don't overthink it. As long as you get a .com domain, you don't have any numbers, you don't have any dashes, uh, you'll be good to go, okay? Um, and then, uh, you know, small advice that I don't hear many people talk about, adding more do uh, adding more years to your domain registry will increase the deliverability as this communicates to the email service providers that you have long-term intentions with the domains and are less likely to be a spammer or a cold emailer, okay? And so obviously this costs more money, you don't have to do it, but if you have, you know, sometimes, and the reason I'm mentioning this is sometimes GoDaddy will offer discounts to purchase the domain for two to three years up front. If they offer you a discount on your domain, I would recommend taking it. You know, you don't have to. Like, this isn't crucial to you having good deliverability. But the more, like, if, 
For example, if the email service providers see, hey, this person bought a domain for two years, that means they're more likely to be legitimate and using the domains for longer term purposes, which means you're less likely to be a spammer in the eyes of the ESPs, email service providers, okay? Um, and so if you go to buy your domains and GoDaddy gives you a deal to, to add an extra year or two to a domain, I would do it. Realistically, you're not going to be able to use a cold email domain for more than a year, most likely. Um, but just the act of doing this, if it doesn't cost much, much extra, will increase the deliverability. Okay, so that's a small trick. Uh, and then another deliverability trick that I don't hear many people talking about when it comes to buying your domains is always make sure that your domains have privacy protection turned off, okay? I see a ton of people, they buy domains and they turn privacy protection on and what when you turn it off, it, so what you do is, is so turning privacy protection off in your domain settings will send your real contact information to who is. So who is, is an organization that works very closely with the email service providers. Um, and so when you leave privacy protection off, it sends your real information to who is, which makes you look more legitimate to the email service providers. But if privacy protection is turned on, it sends fake, it sends obviously fake information to who is, which hurts your deliverability. Okay. Um, and so what I recommend doing is if you purchased your domains through GoDaddy is searching up how to turn privacy protection off on GoDaddy and then just follow those steps. Okay. Um, and so this is very important. Okay. I see a lot of people go wrong with this. Uh, so these are just kind of two deliverability tricks when buying your domains that I don't hear a lot of people talk about. Um, and so I figured I'd mention them. The second one is required. The first one is not. So again, if you add more years to your domain, it will help your deliverability, but obviously it's more expensive and it's not necessary. So you don't have to do it. But if you see GoDaddy give you a deal on your domain to add an extra year and it's not that much extra, I would do it. And then second, make sure privacy protection is turned off when you buy the domains, okay? Uh, and then after you bought your burner domains, following all of those steps, again, the document will be below this video uh, and you can literally use this as a step-by-step -step guide for cold email. Um, but after you bought your domains, the next step is to create the users, okay? And you know, sometimes people get confused on this when I, you know, especially beginners to like domains, users, like what's, what, what does that mean? Uh, and so I'll just attempt to clear this up really quickly, even though most people watching probably know. So first you buy your domains from a domain provider. So for example, GoDaddy, Porkbun, et cetera, right? Once you buy the domains, you need to create users under each domain with an email provider. And the email provider and the domain provider can be separate people, okay? So for example, if we buy a domain from GoDaddy, we can still create users using Outlook and, and then add emails to those domains, okay? Um, and so, you know, like for example, email providers to create the users, that might be G Suite, which you don't wanna use anymore. Uh, it, and, and so again, G Suite has a ton of restrictions around cold email right now, so you can't actually create your users on G Suite. It could be Outlook, it could be Zoho, et cetera, okay? So you buy the domains, and so say that we buy the domain leadodyssey.com, we then have to add emails to that domain. So Jackson at leadodyssey.com, and we do that through the email uh, through the email provider, which could be G Suite, Outlook, or Zoho. But again, for cold email related purposes, you don't want to use G Suite. Okay. So again, if it was the beginning of 2023, I would have recommended that you always use G Suite to create your users. But recently, they've added a ton of restrictions around cold email. They're basically useless now. Okay. Do not use G Suite. Uh, and they're dropping a huge update in 2024 that's gonna make it so you can only send emails to strangers if you have a verified email account and you can only verify one email account at a time. And so that means, you know, with cold email, you need a lot of email accounts. And so G Suite is practically useless for cold email now, okay? Um, and so the best platform, okay, the best platform to create users, so the best email provider to connect your domains to in 2024 is currently Outlook, okay? And Outlook can be accessed through Microsoft 365, okay? So again, it's 2024, no more G Suite. You need to be creating your users on Outlook if you wanna have good deliverability, okay? Um, and so this is accessed through Microsoft 365. Outlook is still a legitimate platform where your deliverability will be good. While at the same time, they have the least restrictions around cold email okay and so after talking to some of the biggest cold email agency owners i've found that all of them are currently using outlook to create email accounts okay and 
typically you would have to pay six dollars a month per user to get microsoft 365 but remember how i said godaddy was currently my favorite domain provider if you purchase domains from GoDaddy, you'll be given the option to add Microsoft 365 email essentials for just $2 per user if you pay for 12 months up front. I would 1000% recommend, recommend doing this, otherwise you'll be paying $6 per user. Um, and so what this looks like is if you go to GoDaddy, let's say that we get WW cold email video 2024, uh, we'll just put a random domain and so search domains. Uh, and so this domain is available. Um, and so see how it's gonna give me, you know, a three year registration for, you know, with good savings. Um, and so for example, we add this domain to our cart using GoDaddy, uh, which is again, the only place that you want to be getting a domain, one of the only places next to pork bun. Uh, and if we go to checkout, you'll notice right here. And so if we just buy two years up front, you know, it's gonna be $30. So yes, obviously we're paying more, but it does help the deliverability. Again, if you don't have access to a lot of money, you totally don't have to do this and you can just buy one year, okay? Uh, and so we're gonna to go to continue to cart. Um, and so it looks like it wants me to sign in. Um, but when you go to, you know, actually purchase it, and so we'll try to go to continue. It's gonna give you this option right here for Microsoft 365 email essentials. So Microsoft 365 includes Outlook and look, Typically, it's going to be $6 per user, but if we get our domain through GoDaddy, we're given a discount of $1.99 per user. The only kind of, I guess, catch, oh, and then domain protection, you don't need this, uh, and then we don't want that, right? Um, and so we do want Microsoft 365 email essentials, so we go to continue to checkout, and the only thing is that we have to pay for 12 months up front, right? And so you're going to add two to three users uh, per domain, and so for example, you just have to pay for those users for 12 months up front, right? And so you're getting a 66% discount for paying it all up front. This is 100% worth doing, okay? So yes, you're putting up a little bit of money up front, but your deliverability is going to be incredible and you're saving 66% in the long term, okay? So this is the best way to buy domains and users, in my opinion, at the moment, is GoDaddy, which is still a good domain provider next to Porkbun, but the only difference between Porkbun and GoDaddy is GoDaddy is going to give you this 66% discount for buying the users, the Outlook user up front for 12 months. And look, if we go to one month, it brings the price back up to $6 per user, okay? And so I would highly recommend paying 12 months up front. This saves you a ton of headaches, a ton of money in the long term. Um, and so that right there is the best way uh, to get your users going in 2024, okay? Now, a lot of people are probably gonna ask, should I use a third-party email host like InfraMail or MailScale since it's cheaper and faster? I would personally recommend avoiding tools like this. Yes, it's cheaper, yes, it's faster, but you typically get what you pay for, right? And if something's too good to be true, it typically is. And you know, and you know, the people who built these platforms, they're amazing. But my personal experience has been that personally, we've tried InfraMail. They have outages where literally none of your emails will land in the inbox. Like, so for example, when we tested them out, there was literally like a 60 day period where just none of the emails were landing in the inbox under InfraMail, okay? And it literally took them like one or two months to fix that problem. And so it's, yes, you can get them cheaper. Yes, you can get them faster. Um, and if you also look at the deliverability, like I'll be honest, it's significantly worse than Outlook. They'll say it's good deliverability. And, and yes, you know, you still can get good deliverability when it is working. It's just not gonna be anywhere close as it is with Microsoft 360 and Outlook, okay? And so the only scenario where I'd recommend using something like InfraMail is if you already purchase half of your domains and users from GoDaddy and Microsoft 365 and you're looking to aggressively scale, okay? So say that you buy 10 domains from GoDaddy and then you you know you create 20, 30 users uh, with Outlook from those domains and then you buy another 10 domains on InfraMail and you create three users per those domains so that you have a total of 60. Half of them are through GoDaddy and Outlook and the other half are on InfraMail, okay? That's the only way that I would recommend using a software like InfraMail or MailScale. That way you don't have all your eggs in one basket and then when InfraMail goes down like it did you know, a couple months ago, you still have inboxes capable of sending with extremely high deliverability, okay? And we've cross-tested We've cross-test InfraMail versus GoDaddy and Outlook 
the differences are insane. Like you're just going to have way, you're going to have, first of all, you're going to have a way better deliverability with Microsoft, with uh, GoDaddy and Outlook, but also it's going to last way longer. Okay. And so I would really just make, recommend paying the money up front to get that good deliverability. Well, you can let your competition be cheap and use tools like this and, and not all, and you know, not as many of their emails are going to land in the inbox, but yours are. Okay. Um, and so to get an edge on the competition, don't be stingy. Just pay the money up front. Trust me. Uh, you know, if you're watching this, you probably know it takes money to make money. Uh, don't be cheap or you're just not going to run a very good business. Okay. Um, and so I'd really recommend going the GoDaddy plus Microsoft 360. Obviously, yes, you have to pay it 12 months up front, but your deliverability is going to be amazing and it's going to last longer and it's going to give you less of a headache in the long term. Okay. Um, and so when creating the users, I recommend creating two to three users per domain. And so, you know, the more users you create, the worse your deliverability will be, but the more emails you'll be able to send. So we kind of want to find a sweet spot. From what I've seen, all the top cold email agency owners typically create two users per domain to maximize deliverability. And then the way that they scale is just buying more domains and creating more users. Okay. So remember, each user is capable of sending 25 to 30 cold emails per day, and you can always buy more domains. Okay. And so the user, if for example, like this is how this is how the users look like. So if my name is Jackson Williams, here's what each user might look like, right? So user one, Jackson at domain doc, at domain one dot com. User two, uh, Jackson W at domain one dot com. Williams at domain one.com. Okay. And again, creating two users is probably going to be the best. So I would just do one. That's your first name at domain. And then I would do a second. That's your first name. And then the first letter of your last name at domain.com. Okay. And so yes, you can create three users per domain and send more cold emails, but your deliverability is going to be better and it's going to last longer if you just do two users. Okay. And yes, you have to pay more to scale because you have to buy more domains, but your deliverability is going to be better. And, and so two is kind of like that sweet spot uh, that when I've talked to a lot of the big lead gen agency owners, they're typically all doing about two. Okay. Um, and so I would really recommend going the two users per domain. Again, you can do three, but you know, it will harm deliverability slightly, but you will be able to send more cold emails. Okay. So if you're on a little bit more of a budget, you could do three users, but if you have the money, I would strongly advise doing two users per domain to maximize deliverability. Okay. Uh, and then just a quick tip, I would recommend using Biscuit Browser to manage all of your users by creating a tab for each user, which will allow you to easily switch between them without needing to log in and log out constantly. Okay. Um, and so in my first cold email video, you know, if you want to learn more about Biscuit Browser, you can skip to that part of the video. Uh, but it's essentially just a software where, you know, you create different tabs for certain platforms. So you would just create a ton of tabs for, for Outlook or Microsoft 360. And then each tab, you would log in to each user. User, and this way, instead of logging in, logging out between all of the users, you just switch tabs and it's automatically logged into each user. Okay. So again, just to recap, the best way to buy domains in 2024 is going to be GoDaddy uh, because it's still a reputable domain provider, but more importantly, you can get a 66% discount on getting users with the best email provider in 2024, which is Outlook. Okay. Um, and so you can combine those two together you know, to get the best deliverability, you're going to want to create two users per each domain. So for example, if we buy the domain getleadodyssey.com on GoDaddy, the first Outlook user would be Jackson at getleadodyssey.com. The second user on, you know, Outlook would be Jackson W at getleadodyssey.com. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, next part is going to be configuring your users and your domains. And so at this point, you should have purchased your domains and added two to three Microsoft 365 slash Outlook users. So again, just so to avoid any confusion, Microsoft 365 includes Outlook and Outlook is where you actually create the, you know, where you actually create the users, right? So in the same way that, you know, Google Workspace is the name, but G Suite is where you create the emails, right? So it's kind of the same thing there, right? Um, and so, you know, Microsoft 365 includes Outlook, but Outlook is where the actual emails are going to be, okay? Um, and so now that you actually have these domains and you've purchased, you know, two to three users per domain, you now need to configure them correctly. Okay. And so configuration number one is going to be making sure that the following three DNS records are configured correctly for each domain. So the first one is going to be SPF. 
The second is gonna be DKIM. The third is gonna be DMARC. Here's a video from Instantly showing you how to set up uh, how to set up all of these records with GoDaddy and with Microsoft 365, okay? Um, and so if you use the setup that I just recommended, you know, that video will show you exactly how to set up all of these three records properly uh, using GoDaddy and Microsoft, okay? And I can't stress this enough, but even if you think that you set them up properly, it's crucial that you actually test to make sure that they're figured properly, okay? So a big mistake I see is someone will set up two DMARC records because at, you know when they first bought the domain, they, they did it, but they forgot about it. Then they went to set up a second one. And if you have two of these records, they both kind of counteract each other and it's basically like you have none, okay? Or I've seen, it, I've seen it all the time where someone makes a small spelling error in one of these records and then it's not configured properly, okay? So even if you think you did it right, just to be safe, I would always recommend using MX Toolbox, uh, which will allow you to see if all of these records are set up properly, okay? So again, this is gonna take time and effort to test. I can't stress it enough. I've seen it so many times where someone accidentally launches a campaign and you know one small mistake made it so that the records weren't configured properly and you know it's gonna absolutely tank your deliverability, okay? So you need to set up those three records, but you need to actually take the time to test that they were done properly, okay? Uh, and then, Configuration number two is gonna be making sure that you add a custom tracking domain to each domain's DNS records. So the two main cold email softwares I recommend using in 2024 is Instantly or Smartly. And so in this document, I've included a link to a guide on how to set up a custom tracking domain depending on what software you're using because it is gonna be different. All you need to do is set up a custom tracking domain. The reason for this is because if you don't and you start tracking open rates, it's gonna use a public tracking domain, which means other people who are using that public tracking domain, if they're not following best deliverability practices, it's gonna harm you, okay? So it's kind of like sharing a toothbrush. You know, that's the weird way that I've heard it described by instantly. Uh, if you don't get a custom tracking domain, you're technically like sharing a toothbrush and other people may be doing bad things with that toothbrush, which it then harms you, okay? Um, and so really just recommend and setting up a custom tracking domain. Eventually you turn open tracking off, but while you have it on, you wanna make sure that it's through a custom tracking domain, okay? Um, and so you wanna just make sure you follow one of these guides, depending on if you're using Instantly or if you're using Smartlead, okay? Uh, and then configuration number three, make sure that each domain forwards to a proper landing page. So this will significantly increase your, your results. And, you know, just in general, like, We've ran campaigns between two agency owners, literally the same, very similar offers, very similar emails, and one of them, and, and different leads, one of them, and like different leads is in the same ICP, just, you know, not emailing duplicates. And one of the agency owners got incredible results and the other person got terrible results. The only difference between the two agency owners is that one had an optimized landing page that all the burner domains forwarded to, but he also had a good online presence. So if someone Googled his company name, his landing page showed up at the top. He had a LinkedIn company page showed up at the top. He had an Instagram, a YouTube that all showed up at the top. Okay. And so not only do you want to make sure that the burner domains forward to a proper landing page, because here's the thing, when you buy the burner domains, if someone copies it, so like when you send an email to someone, a good percentage of people are going to copy your burner domain and try to look for more info about your company. And if you don't set up forwarding, it's going to say 404 error and all your trust is going to go out the window. Okay. And I can't stress this enough, but having a good online presence. So optimizing your own LinkedIn profile, build, making a, a company LinkedIn profile, making sure it's optimized, there's case studies, client interviews, etc. Just making sure you have a good online presence when someone searches up your name or your company name, make sure that positive things are showing up, but more importantly, make sure that something actually is showing up. Um, and so if you go to Google right now and you search your company name and nothing comes up, that's gonna significantly harm your cold email results, okay? So I can't stress that enough. Um, but configuration number three is making sure that all of your domains forward to your main domain and more importantly, a proper landing page, okay? So a good landing page should include a bold claim headline, right? So you should have a good copywriting headline. You should have a video sales letter on your landing page. You should have a breakdown of your offer. You should have all your available case studies and client interviews. And then you should have an option to book a call with you. And then you should have a Q&A or FAQ section of all the most popular asked questions, okay? Uh, and so I linked a guide right here on how to redirect your GoDaddy domains to a landing page. But I can't stress this enough, 
make sure you have a proper landing page with all of these components and then set it up so that all your domains forward there because a large percentage of people are going to get your cold email and before they respond they're going to copy the domain that that you sent them an email from and they're going to try to see get more info on your company and you want there to be positive reinforcements that encourage them to then reply okay um and so i can't stress that enough make sure that they forward somewhere preferably an optimized landing page okay uh configuration number four make sure that each user has a professional profile file picture as i've seen this one configuration alone increase reply rates by two to three percent okay so i'll see it all the time people launch a cold email campaign and they don't add a profile picture and then the emails are just sending out from a blank profile picture okay um and so again if you use something like informail it's going to be near impossible to add profile pictures there is a way to do it it's just kind of weird and, and you know i don't want to break that down right now but if you did things correctly and you bought your users through outlook make sure that you add a profile picture to each user that's actually professional don't like i've seen some people they they do these profile pictures and they look like a little kid or they look it's just super low quality it's like that's gonna hurt you okay so make sure you have a professional headshot for your cold email profile picture uh and if you don't have any use an ai headshot software to make them so if you look at the profile my profile picture on youtube right now that was made with ai okay and so you can get a really good profile picture with ai okay and so that's what i would recommend doing if you don't have one and then log in to each outlook user and set the profile using that professional profile picture another trick is you can use a gif so if you look in the top right corner right now you'll see that my profile picture on google is changing it goes between my profile picture and then our company logo and i actually need to update it uh because it's an old profile picture but you can upload a gif as your profile picture and then when your email is in the inbox on mobile it will stand out to the prospects because the profile picture is moving okay and then all you do is just make a gif that flashes between your you know your company logo and your profile picture make sure that it's not too fast um or i've seen some people do their profile picture and then the other picture will be like an ex a red exclamation point over the profile picture or it'll say like one for like one new email and, and so you know those are small things you can do but the biggest thing is that each user just has a profile picture that's going to be the biggest thing okay uh, and then configuration number five the final step is going to be to add each user to your cold email sending software and activate warm-up okay um and so in 2024, there's really only two softwares that I'd be using to send cold emails. That's going to be Instantly or Smartlead, okay? And so Instantly is going to be a lot more user-friendly. Obviously, they've been around pretty long now. Smartlead, personally, I'm starting to really prefer just because if you're if you're familiar with APIs and, and automations, there's a lot more advanced stuff that you can do with Smartlead. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, I'm starting to prefer Smartlead, okay? So I might think Smartlead's better. I haven't made up my mind yet, but what i have noticed as well talking to a lot of big cold email agency owners is they're all using smart lead okay um and so again you know i would recommend choosing only and like you know what is it really going to affect your results that much maybe maybe not but i would only recommend choosing between these two okay so very recently there was a lifetime deal on a cold email sending software and yes instantly started as a lifetime deal so like two three years ago you could have got instantly on AppSumo for life for a one-time price but don't try to save money by using a software that you got a lifetime deal for as the warm-up pool is likely lower quality than instantly or smart lead at least at this point in time right so yes instantly started out on AppSumo, but now their warm-up pool is so much better um whereas if you're again if you're using something other than instantly or smart lead your warm-up pool is just not going to be as good okay um and so again don't try and save money by using that lifetime cold email software that you got the reason that you even want to do that is because it's likely to be good in the future but in the meantime you probably don't want to use it because the warm-up pool is going to be lower quality and so the warm-up pool are the emails that are actually in that are also on warm-up and if you know there's other emails on warm-up that aren't official or are doing bad deliverability practices you know you're sending emails back and forth with them and that will hurt you okay and so instantly and smartly they're very strict about their warm-up pool where you're if like on smart lead 
they completely banned all inframail users at one point in time because they were hurting the warm-up pool okay and so like these platforms they keep a very good eye on the quality of their warm-up pool because they have access to more money because you're paying them a hundred dollars a month okay and so i would really just only recommend using instantly and smart lead even if you a couple weeks ago there was that lifetime cold email deal the reason you bought that is in the hopes that it's good in the future but you don't want to be using it right now okay um and so only use instantly only use smart lead again don't cut corners uh this is a business this isn't a 99 cent store um and so just pay 100 dollars a month use instantly use smart lead don't be a brokey get access to good software good warm-up pools okay um and then search up how to add microsoft 365 slash outlook emails to your sending software and proceed to connect each user and activate the warm up feature. Okay. And so, you know, adding Microsoft emails to instantly is actually easier than adding G suite emails. Okay. So again, I'm not going to go into this. Most people are probably familiar with it by now. If you're not just Google, if you're using instantly Google, how to add Microsoft 365 and outlook emails to instantly. If you're using smart lead, just Google the same thing, but on smart lead. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be really easy. Once you connect them to the sending software, you need to leave each user on warm up for a 14 day period before proceeding to send cold emails. Okay. So again, you need to be patient with this. I see a lot of people, they try to cut corners, they do warm up for seven days, and then they try to start sending. Can you do this? Yes, but it's going to harm your long term and short term deliverability. Okay. Um, and deliverability is just the percentage of your emails that are landing in the inbox versus spam. Okay. And so I strongly recommend just being patient. And yes, it sucks. And you're going to get very giddy because you're going to want to start sending cold emails. But trust me, just be patient. Uh, it's going to help you get better results. And it's going to help you m maintain those results is leave your emails on warm up for at least 14 days. Okay. And you always leave your emails on warm up. Like after these 14 days, you do not turn off warm up. You leave it on indefinitely. But the first 14 days should be only warm up emails, no cold emails. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and so that's really the 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 best tech setup for cold email in 2024. Uh, and so by this point, you should have all the inboxes and domains configured properly, and you know set up best practices. Part two of the video is going to be lead scraping. Okay. And so the first step to scraping leads is building what we call an ICP. And so what ICP stands for is your ideal client profile. Okay. And this is the well defined understanding of the perfect company and person inside of that company who can actually make the decision to buy our services. Okay. And so in short, your ICP is the definition of the company and person who is most likely to resonate with the offer that you're selling. Okay. And if you're selling to solopreneurs, like real estate agents, lawyers, financial advisors, you're going to be focusing more on the ICP of the person versus the company. But you know, what might be an important data point is if you're selling to real estate agents, you might still want to focus on which brokerages, right? So like, for example, when we build lead lists in the real estate niche, we're not just letting it on all real estate agents, we're filtering it by real estate agents who are a part of specific brokerages that are less likely to give their agents leads because the agents who work for these brokerages that are less likely to be giving them leads are probably going to be in more need of a lead gen based service. Okay. And so even if you're selling to solopreneurs, yes, you're focusing more on the person than the company, but it does still matter. Right. And if you're in the real estate niche, look at all of your clients and you might notice a similarity between their brokerages. And that's a good insight to have when you're filtering lead lists. Okay. Um, and in order to scrape high, highly targeted lead lists and book meetings that actually turn into paying clients. So it's one thing to book meetings with cold email, but it's another thing to book meetings with clients that actually or to book meetings with people who actually turn into clients is taking the time to build your ICP. Okay, this is key to you getting the best possible results with your cold email. It seems like something that's maybe unnecessary, or very boring. I promise you that couldn't be farther from the truth. All the top guys are doing this to get the best results. Okay. And so when building your ICP, you want to consider the following. So at the company level, the location, right? So depending, you know, there again, you want to try to get as many leads as you can, but you also want it to be targeted. And so, you know, typically, you know, in a lot of cases, you might be operating in the big five. And so the big five are going to be the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and then New Zealand. So those are the big five. 
anything outside of there and typically the currency exchange is too much where they won't be able to pay you high ticket um, but you know again you want to really dial in where like so for example if you're targeting real estate agents you know the the real estate market might be different in the UK and you might want to only target agents in the United States and Canada right and so you really want to think about uh, and you know more specifically also if you're targeting companies so if you're working with home improvement companies you know you might want to target Canada the UK and the United United Kingdom, right? And so you need to be thinking about the location. Uh, you need, and again, based on their location, they might be more likely to be able to work with you. So these are all things you want to think about. You want to think about company size, right? There might be a certain employee count that once they have more than a certain number of employees, they're less likely to need an agency, right? And so again, it's very important to understand these things when you're building lead lists because you know you want the cold emails that you're sending that you know you can only send a certain amount of cold emails per day. You want them going to the highest probability of people who are most likely to become a client and at that a good client, okay? And so what you might notice when you build your ICP is that after a certain employee size, the chances of that company needing to pay an agency owner drop significantly or it might be the opposite, right? There might need to be a certain amount of employees to indicate that that company would need your services, right? So these are things you wanna think about. Estimated revenue, right? There might be a certain level of estimated revenue that's needed. Like for example, if you're working with home improvement company owners, they might need to be making at least half a million a year to even afford the marketing budget and your retainer, okay? Or whatever your pricing model is. The industry, right? And so when you're scraping leads on Apollo, a really good way to build targeted searches is through the industry, right? So you have industry and keywords, you have all of these industries right here, and you wanna understand the exact industries that are gonna allow you to identify your target market, okay? Keywords, this is how you build and find, like for example, I tell people, they come to me all the time, they're like, Jackson, I couldn't find my, my ICP on Apollo, and I ask them, did you use keywords? And they say no, okay? Um, and so finding the exact keywords that you know your ideal client profile is likely to be found under these lead scraping tools is very important, right? technologies they use right for example if you're trying if you're selling email marketing to e-commerce uh, e-commerce companies you might want to you know they're if the leads who are already using Clavio as an email marketing tool they're going to be so much more likely to need your services right or if you're just trying to build a list of e-commerce brands they're going to be so much more you know you're it's going to be easier to find that them on Apollo if you know if they're using Shopify as a technology right and so what technology are they using these are you know all the lead scraping tools will give you filtering options based on technology and you know a technology might be a specific software and you know again there's specific softwares that if a company is using them they're going to be more likely to be your icp your ideal client right so again if you want to target e-commerce brands they're likely to be using shopify plus as a technology or if you're trying to sell email marketing to them you might want to find e-commerce brands that are using Clavio as a software, right? Or if you're selling lead generation to local businesses, you might want to choose local businesses that are already using HubSpot as a CRM. And then maybe you can even use that in the cold email as a personalization point, right? Hey, I saw you're using HubSpot, XYZ, XYZ, right? Um, so technologies they use, you want to take note of these things. Funding history, again, this might not be relevant to everyone, but, you know, based off whatever your service is, the person, you know, the person who's most likely to need your services might be someone who got a recent round of funding, right? Uh, if you're if you're doing sales team recruitment, right? Someone who just got a, a SaaS company who just got a ton of funding, they're going to be more likely to want to start building their sales team, right? Or you can use that in the cold email. Notice you just got Series B funding, for example, right? Uh, job postings. This is huge, right? So lead scraping softwares, they allow you to scrape by job postings. For example, you know, a company who's going to be most likely to need your services, they might be hiring for a certain role, right? Like, for example, if you're selling lead gen to agency owners, established agency owners like big agencies, they're gonna or, or big SaaS. Like for example, if you're selling lead generation to SaaS companies, it might be useful for you to 
only target SaaS companies who have a job post for an SDR, which is an outbound appointment setter, meaning that you know they're more likely to need your lead gen services because they're actively looking to pay someone to bring them more appointments, right? And so people don't really think about all these things that really help you build a targeted lead list that is gonna have the highest probability of needing your services, okay? Uh, and then the people, right? So what job titles, right? Like for example, if you're targeting a home improvement company above a certain revenue, account you don't want to be reaching out to the founder they're going to be harder to reach you want to be reaching out to the marketing directors right the marketing related decision makers in the company because they're going to be the ones that you would be working with because the company is so big right like we had a campaign that absolutely ripped and instead of uh instead of targeting home improvement company founders for these bigger 20 million dollar plus year home improvement companies we started uh targeting the marketing related decision makers because again if you partner up with one of these big companies companies as an agency, you're not going to be talking to the owner. It's too big of a company. You're going to be talking to the marketing department, right? And so it's understanding the job title or titles of the decision makers within that company that you're trying to reach. Okay. And so it's not always going to be founder, right? It might be all C-suite titles. It might be a marketing related decision maker, right? So you really want to have a good understanding of the job title of who you're trying to target and ultimately who can make the decision of buying your services. Because again, it's who can make that buying decision and who's also going to be the easiest way to get access to that company. Okay. Years of experience. Again, how many years of experience does the person have, right? Um, and so again, these are really the only two things you need to worry about at the people level. So there's a lot more to worry about at the company level. So again, if you're targeting real estate agents, you're going to be more so worried about the people level than the company level. Um, but for example, like, you know, I think it's like 67% of agents fail after the first five years. So, or, you know, maybe you just like, for example, yes, you could probably book more meetings with beginner real estate agents because there's more of them and they're less exposed to outreach, but they're going to be more likely to have the money to afford your services. And even if they do have the money to afford your services, they're going to be a nightmare to work with because they still haven't gone through that real estate learning curve or, or adopted the mindset they need to be a successful agent. So you might want to also filter by years of experience or knowing that 67% of realtors fail within the first five years, maybe you only target realtors above five years. And this is something that we've done. And you know, we actually booked less meetings by only filtering by realtors above five years of experience, but that there was a higher close rate on the meetings that came in. So it resulted in more cash flow, which at the end of the day is all that matters above meetings, right? Um, and so all these things are things that you need to consider when you're building your lead list, right? I see a lot of people, all they do is open up Apollo, put in a couple job titles and maybe one other filter. It's like, you know, you want to be considering more things than just job title, for example. Okay. And the easiest way to find the answers to all of these. So I would literally copy this and paste it in another Google doc and start jotting down all of these things. Okay. The easiest way to find these answers is writing down the names of your top three to five clients and then searching them up in Apollo. Okay. And if you don't have more than, than three top clients, then find three to five examples of who your ideal client would be and do the same thing, okay? And again, this might seem unnecessary, but trust me, this is gonna get you the best possible results when you're cold email, with your cold email campaign and give you plug and play filtering options for when you scrape your lead list, okay? So once you, you know, if you really take the time to do this, it's very easy to then scrape leads. You already have all the filters that you need. Um, and so if we go to Apollo, say for example, that these five companies that I searched up, say for example, these were my top five clients, right? Say that the say that my top five clients who not only closed, but got the best results with me, I would search them up on Apollo. So say that I'm in the remodeling niche, I would top, I would type in my top, you know, four to five clients who got the best results with me. Or if I don't have that many clients, what I would do is then go to Google and really search up who you hypothesize, which companies you think would be your ideal client, and then search them up on Apollo. And what you're going to do is you're going to click on their company profile. And you can see right here, there's two industries, right? Construction and design. And so I would write this down. I would copy this. I would go back to my ICP document and I would go to industry 
and I would paste construction and design next to it, okay? Um, and so when you go to build your lead list, to get leads similar to your top clients, you can find them under these two industries, right? Or maybe if you were to just go to try to build the lead list without this, maybe you would have only put construction and not design, okay? And so that's why it's important to do this, okay? So the industry, construction and design, right? Uh, founding year, 2010, you know, employees, three. There's only three employees in this company. Um, and so that's something that's good to know, right? What are the job titles? So there's a marketing specialist, construction manager, senior electrical engineer, here, right you can also ask ChatGPT what are all the job titles of decision makers at a construction company but more importantly look at all of these keywords right contractors uh, home services um, and so we'll go back home services local services professional services roofing right and so these are all keywords we can use to find more leads like this right um, and so if we if we look at another example right here their only industry is construction right their annual revenue is a million they also have three employees there there's new keywords here right room uh you know i don't even know how to say that uh, <laughs> uh flooring remodeling windows doors exterior painting home building bathroom remodeling home improvement kitchen remodeling complete home remodeling side roofing right uh if we go to the technologies they're only using one technology, which is why you want to look through multi multiple. Uh, if we look at this one, you can see, you know, 12 employees, right? They don't have any keywords available. They're in the uh, construction industry technologies, right? Amazon AWS, you know, we can look at they're using Outlook, right? They're using YouTube. And so some of these softwares are obviously very basic. But what Apollo does is they pay a lot of different people to get this data. And so for example, you know, there's certain softwares that will tell you if they're using that, right? You can go to job postings, you can see if they have any job postings, you know, you can look at recent news of the company, etc. Right? And so this is what you want to do is you want to use Apollo as a tool to build your ICP. Um, and so you want to, you know, search up your top three three to five clients or just top three to five examples of your ideal client, write down all the keywords, write down their average employee count, what softwares they're using, etc. And then you can use that to start building your ICP, right? So see, in this example, we found two new industries that we can use for building our next lead list. We also found all of these keywords, we found an average annual revenue, and we found different softwares. Um, and so we'll see if they have a job post. No, they don't. Um, and so again, you know, this is kind of a process you can do to speed up finding these things. Okay. Um, and some of it, you might also just hypothesize, right? You might just hypothesize, oh, I think my ideal client would be using HubSpot, right? Um, and so you can also hypothesize like that. Okay. Um, and you know, for example, use companies using spe specific technology might indicate they are more likely to need your services, right? So again, if you sell email marketing, companies who are already using Klaviyo will be more likely to resonate with your offer. Or companies hiring for a specific role may also be more likely to need your services. For example, if you sell B2B lead gen, companies with a hiring post for an SDR are more likely to resonate with your offer, right? So these are all examples of why it's so important to actually go through this exercise and answer all of the ICB questions is because you can build a list that is going to basically get you more clients, okay? So the key to building very good lead lists is taking the time to build an ICP for all of these reasons that we kind of talked about. Again, the whole purpose is to have a well-defined understanding of the perfect perfect company or the perfect person inside of that company who can make the decision to buy our services. And again, this is the definition of the company in person who is most likely to resonate with what we're selling. And if we can figure this out, we're going to make, we're going to, you know, we might not book more meetings, but we're definitely going to close more clients. Okay. And so that's why it's very important to take the time to do this. Now, keep in mind, your ICP may not be perfect at first, and you'll likely need to make some adjustments and iterations over time. And the easiest way to test different ICPs is by launching cold email campaigns and getting direct feedback, okay? So the very first step to building a lead list is to build this ICP. And as you can see, pretty much all of these you know, different things are filtering options on Apollo that make it very easy to then plug and play and build a lead list, okay? Um, and so, before you ever open up a lead scraping tool like Apollo to build your list, I would first define your ICP, okay? So that's the very first one. Uh, so moving on, lead scraping tools, okay? So there's a bunch of amazing list building tools out there in 2024. 
typically I'm using one of these three. Okay. So this is just like personally, keep in mind, we work with a lot of agency owners in a local business niche. Uh, and I'm going to give you other options, but us personally, we use these three lead sources 90% of the time. Okay. Um, and so the first one is Apollo. The second one is Outscraper, And the third is natural congregations. Okay. So I'll kind of break down each of them. Um, and so Apollo is still my number one choice. A lot of people talk about about bad about it. Honestly, it's, it's amazing. I don't know why it gets so much hate. Uh, it's, it's, they have one of the biggest databases. They're backed by the most capital. They've been around the longest. They have more data than other lead vendors, right? Because they have the most capital so they can buy more data like technology, like all these different things. Um, and Apollo is really going to be the best if you need to scrape B2B slash solopreneurs, like agency owners, SaaS founders, recruitment companies, e-commerce brands, real estate agents, financial advisors, lawyers, anything kind of in that route. And, and Apollo is going to be amazing. Uh, and they also have, again, more filtering options than most data vendors, which makes it easier to find find your exact ICP. So with Apollo, all you're going to do is take your ICP and go to the people search, and you're going to enter all of the pre-selected filters based on what you found when you were building your ICP. Okay. Um, and then if you plan on using Apollo, you need to use it with expert Apollo.io. So again, if you just use Apollo by itself, you're going to, you know, you're going to have to pay a hundred dollars a month. You're only going to get, I think like 2000 lead export limit, and you're going to have to manually do it page by page. Okay. So that's obviously a massive waste of time and a very big restriction. And so when, when we scrape leads from Apollo, we use export Apollo uh, which is, I'm not going to say who to protect their name, but it's someone who's very big in the space who owns an enterprise plan of Apollo. And he's connected it through the cloud where you can access his enterprise plan. Okay. And so you can look at the costs, they're incredible, right? Uh, 10,000 leads for $30, but more importantly, you get them instantly. Okay. Um, and so all you do is you build your lead list in Apollo, and then you copy your, your search, and then you go to export Apollo, get my leads. You just fill out this form right here, enter your Apollo search, and the leads will be sent to you instantly at a discount. Okay. Um, and so do not use Apollo without using export Apollo .io. You're going to be wasting a ton of time, a ton of money, and you're going to be restricted to how many leads you can scrape, which is also going to limit you in testing different ICPs. Okay. Um, and so not only does it let you scrape the leads instantly, but you get a 70% market discount. So there's literally no point in using Apollo without expert Apollo.io. Okay. And so I've linked that in the document again, it'll be below. Uh, and then and you can even do this with the free Apollo plan. So you'll notice this is literally a free Apollo plan. You'll you'll lose access to some of these filters, but as long as you can come in here and build a list and copy this search, you can use export Apollo, but you can pay the lowest Apollo plan if you wanna get access to these filters. Um, but again, you're not scraping the leads directly from Apollo. You're just using it to enter the filters and then you're copying the URL with the applied filters and taking it to export Apollo, which will pull the leads from the cloud from their account, which is on the enterprise plan. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. But if you're using Apollo, just use export Apollo.io. Uh, even if you're using the free Apollo plan, you can still get away with using export Apollo. You just want to have access to th four or five of those filters. Okay. Um, and then my second favorite tool next to Apollo is going to be Outscraper. Uh, and this is a tool that scrapes directly from Google Maps. Um, and so Outscraper is the best if you're scraping local businesses like home improvement companies, chiropractors, med spas, lands landscapers, solar companies, auto detailers. Um, and so I have a feeling a lot of the people subscribed to me on YouTube are in these, their agency owners in these more local based niches. Uh, and so Outscraper, I've found to really be the best for these. Um, and so I've typically found Apollo to have a lower supply of local businesses such as home improvement companies uh, and all the examples that I just gave. So I, I typically use Outscraper after exhausting these niches on Apollo, okay? So I always start with Apollo and then, but typically like for example, like in the home improvement niche, in the, you know, in the med spa niche, in the landscaper niche, there's gonna be not a lot of leads on Apollo. I would still start with Apollo because again, the leads on there are gonna be really good. But as soon as you run out of leads on Apollo, then move to Outscraper. And Outscraper is gonna have way more leads in these niches because what it does is it scrapes directly from Google Maps, okay? So if I search up home improvement companies on Google, uh, it's gonna scrape the emails of all those Google business profiles. Or if I search up, you know, auto detailers near me, 
Outscraper is going to scrape all the emails from those Google business profiles. Okay. Um, and keep in mind, Outscraper will only give you the company name and not the decision maker's name. So again, that's why I normally start on Apollo because I get more data. Um, but either way, like, don't let this stop. Don't let this like scare you. Some of our highest performing campaigns have been with Outscraper leads. Okay. Um, and so Outscraper is amazing. Uh, and the main downside of Outscraper is the lack of filtering. So like, you know, on, on Outscraper, you're just not going to get anywhere close as many filtering options. So like, for example, like it's very different than Apollo, like say, for example, I wanted to target a remodeler, uh, I would just search up like kitchen remodeler, bathroom remodeler. Uh, and besides that, I really don't have that many filtering options. Okay. Um, and so that and like, obviously, I can still choose location, city, state zip codes. But besides that, you know, you can't choose things like technology, etc. Um, and so that's really one of the only downsides. But again, we've gotten incredible results with Outscraper. Uh, and it's an amazing tool, something you can do is you can potentially, you know, build a list of domains from Outscraper and then upload them to Apollo and, or other databases to get furthering filtering options. So what I mean by that is you could build a list on Outscraper, which is going to give you the websites of all the companies that you scraped. You can upload those domains uh, into the companies tab here on uh, into the companies tabs here on Apollo. And then you can get a list of all the people who work inside of those companies and their emails using Apollo. Um, and so you could get a list of companies from Outscraper and then enrich the, that list of companies and get the and get job titles under those companies using Apollo. So that is also an option. Okay. And so again, I would always start on Apollo, especially if you're like B2B, like if you're if you're selling to agency owners, SaaS founders, don't use uh, Outscraper, only stay on Apollo. But again, if you're in any of these kind of local niches, like chiropractors, med spas, landscapers, start on Apollo. But once you run out of leads, which will probably happen pretty fast, then I would switch to Outscraper. And again, like we've gotten some like in niches like home improvement, uh, you know, landscapers, like our top performing campaigns have been with leads from Outscraper. Okay. So if you're in any of those niches, like Outscraper is an amazing choice. Okay. Assuming that you're doing the cold emails correctly, etc. Okay. Um, and so my third favorite, and again, like there's a ton of amazing lead scraping tools out there. These are typically like the main ones that, that, that we're using and I'll give you other options, but typically we're going to be using Apollo outscraper. And then what I'm about to talk about right now, which is natural congregations. Okay. Uh, and so my third favorite method for scraping leads is simply finding natural congregations where my ICP is most likely to be, and then using VAs or external tools to scrape leads from these natural congregations. Um, and so for example, a natural congregation might be Zillow, right? If I'm selling to real estate agents, uh, there's going to be a ton of them on Zillow and I can see how many reviews they have, which means they're more likely to be selling homes and making money. I can see if they're already paying Zillow and if my service is faster, better and cheaper than Zillow, that's going to be a great place to go find people who are already investing in the real estate business. Um, but again, you know, so so that's what a natural congregation is, right? It's a it's a specific place where my ICP is most likely to be congregating. And then what you do is you pay a $3 an hour VA to go to that natural congregation and build a list of their emails, or there's other tools, depending on where the congregation is that will allow you to scrape leads from that congregation. Okay. Um, and so this can be an amazing option, like Facebook groups is another one, right? Um, and so for example, if I want to sell to, you know, real estate agents who are actively looking into into marketing, or if I want to sell to real estate agents who have already bought a marketing course, I can pay for that course, get access to the Facebook group, and then have a VA look at all the members in that Facebook group and get their emails. Or another example is we sell the agency owners who are, you know, who are above, who are between like 10 to 50 K per month. Uh, and typically, you know, some of them are already running ads. And so if I want to get a very specific ICP like that, or if I want to reach agency owners above 50 K per month who are already running ads, I can go into a Facebook group like Hyros, which is Alex Becker's ad tracking software. In order to join the group, you have to post a screenshot to show proof that you're running ads. Um, and so I know that everyone inside of that Facebook group is already running Facebook ads. Right. And so if I get into that group, I can have a VA one by one, go through the, the list of names in the group, copy them into Apollo or seamless.io, enrich them and get their contact information and build a lead list. That's going to be very close to my ICP, right? 
You can do the same with LinkedIn groups, Instagram followers. So again, there might be certain like influencers in your niche that if someone's following them, they're much more likely to be in your ICP. Same with Twitter followers, right? And so really all that the, the lead source of natural congregations is going in very specific places if you have a very specific ICP or to find people who are going to be more likely to purchase your services uh, and then using manual methods like a paying a virtual assistant or some software tools to then scroll emails from those natural congregations okay or using enrichment tools so you could have a VA go into a Facebook group and one by one kind of copy each you know uh, members name search up that name on Apollo or seamless and then scrape their email using a lead list tool okay um, and yes in most cases this is gonna take more time and more money but it's extremely effective if your ICP is extremely specific or you just want higher quality leads, okay? And again, there's a ton of other amazing lead scraping tools. These are just the three that I've been using the most, but if I can't get what I need from one of them, I use one of the following below, okay? So again, these aren't, you don't limit yourself to just Apollo, Outscraper, and Natural Congregations. Typically, this is what we use the most for the purposes that we need leads for, okay? Um, but if we can't get what we need from one of those three sources, we'll use tools like ListKit, right? So ListKit just came into the market by the people over at Client Ascension. Amazing tool because the leads are already verified. The, you know, the catch-alls have already been validated. The company names have already been formatted. Uh, and when you scrape the leads, they're automatically getting scrambled to avoid the same exact leads getting messages over and over and over again, okay? Um, and so list kit is an amazing option. It's just a little bit more expensive because they do all of those things for you. But a list kit is amazing, amazing alternative to Apollo. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit more on the, the pricey end, but it's going to save you a ton of time, right? Um, and so you have more capital and your time is more valuable to you and you want a really high quality lead list. List kit is going to be amazing. Okay. Sales navigator plus third party tools, right? Like sales navigator, also an amazing lead source. Seamless.ai, also an amazing lead source. Uh, store leads, right? If you're in e-commerce, store leads is going to be the best place for you to get build your lead list, right? Because it's going to give you more specific filtering relevant to e-commerce than something like Apollo. Okay. Um, and so store leads, if you're in the in-commerce e-commerce niche, uh, crunch base, if you're in the SaaS niche is an amazing lead scraping tool. Uh, and then IG leads.io, this is an amazing platform. It's going to allow you to scrape leads from Instagram. Okay. Uh, so IG leads.io, this is amazing. You know, you can scrape emails directly from, uh, you can scrape emails directly from Instagram. So again, if there's a specific Instagram hashtag or account, that's a natural congregation for your ICP, you can use IG leads to then pull emails from that natural congregation. Okay. Um, and so those are really the top three places I would be getting leads. And if you can't get what you need from one of those three places, then you can use this list. Okay. Now, again, really, as long as you're getting good data, and so again, like Apollo has amazing data. A lot of people talk bad about it, but they do have really good data. ListKit has really good data. Outscraper is going to be really good. As long as you're building an ICP and you're using one of these platforms, you should be able to get pretty solid leads. Okay. But again, think of leads like the oil to your vehicle that is cold email. And if you're putting bad oil in that vehicle, it's not going to run properly. Okay. So a lot of people will build this cold email system, but they scrape very bad leads or they just don't take the time to build an ICP. And that's like pouring bad oil into their cold email system. Okay. And so the output of your cold email, the, you know, the output of your cold email system is going to be, you know, it's going to be dependent on the input. And in this case, the input is the leads. Okay. So take your time on lead scraping. Uh, make sure to kind of use everything we just talked about. Uh, the next step is once you've actually built your lead list, it's time to verify format and enrich. Okay. Um, and so after exporting your lead list from your scraping tool, there's still a few more crucial steps before you can upload the list to instantly or smart lead. Um, and so the first thing is going to be verification. Okay. Um, and at this point, most people in the space know this, but you need to be verifying your leads. Okay. Even if the lead scraping software says that they're verified, right? Um, and so data churns at around a 9% monthly rate. Um, and so all these leads just sitting in these databases, they're churning every month. And what I mean by this is 
people get fired, they switch jobs, they switch brokerages, they switch firms, uh, they change their email name, right? They edit the users, they, they get a new user, their one user got suspended, right? Um, and, and that happens at a 9% monthly rate. And this leads to the emails in the database no longer being valid, right? And so there's all these emails in Apollo, uh, and they're just sitting there in Apollo or any of these other, you know, lead sourcing tools. But some of those people are changing jobs, changing emails. And that means those emails in that, you know, database are no longer valid. Okay. Um, and again, most people don't know this, but you know, also some lead vendors, they literally just take guesses on some of their emails and they were never valid to begin with. Right. Um, and so there's some, you know, some of these big lead source vendors, they actually can't find, you know, a leads email and they'll just take a guess on it based off their name. And so if the company name is JD contracting, uh, and then, and then the, the founder's name is John, they'll just take a guess and they'll add that person person's email as john at jdcontracting.com. And so a lot of these big lead vendors, they actually just take guesses on some of the data that they put in their database. Um, and then between data churning and then that, you know, the guessing game that's happening, you know, these emails aren't really valid, even if they say they are. Okay. And so it's important to understand this is if you, if you email an email address that is not valid, you'll get what's called a bounce uh, and too many bounces and the email service providers start to suspect that you're a potential spammer. And as a result, they said they start sending your emails to spam. Okay. Um, and so your goal should be to keep your bounce rate under two to 3%. Uh, and the number one email verification tool, in my opinion, is going to be million verifier. Okay. No questions asked this is going to be the best tool for verifying your emails yes it's going to be more expensive than other options um but again you typically get what you pay for okay um and so i would only recommend using million verifier because you're already paying for the leads you might as well you know make that list as accurate as it can possibly be okay um and so i would only recommend using million verifier yes you can get cheaper verification elsewhere but your bounce rate is going to be higher okay so i would only use million verifier again we want to do things the right way uh, and so always verify your lead list using million verifier. Okay. Um, but then we're not done. Okay. So there's a process called validating catch alls. Um, and after your emails have been validated on million verifier, I recommend doing something that's called validating your catch alls. Um, and so some domain owners will activate a catch all feature where any emails sent to users under their domain regardless of whether these users actually exist, the emails will all be forwarded to a catch all address. And so some people turn on this setting under their domain settings, where say, for example, that there's a user called support at leadodyssey.com, even if that user doesn't exist, if you send it an email, it will be redirected to jackson at leadodyssey.com if I turn catch alls on, okay? Um, and so don't worry about understanding this too much, but Million Verifier will send all of the emails that are catch alls under the risky category. And because of this, most people who verify their leads, they ignore catch all emails. Um, but, and you know, the truth is there's still some good emails in there that everybody else is ignoring. And so if we can get these emails and email them, we're going to have better results because not everyone else is throwing these leads away. Okay. And so they're not getting as many cold emails as the rest of the market. Um, and, but the problem is that the majority of emails categorized under catch all are actually not safe and will, will result result in a bounce. And so we want to look at ourselves as a surgeon who's going into the catch all emails and safely removing the ones that are valid so that we can email them to get a bigger lead list, you know, because we're paying for the leads to get a bigger lead list of actually valid leads, but also to message leads who don't typically receive cold emails. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you know, again, they're the, typically though, a lot of them aren't going to be safe. Okay. However, if you can validate the ones that are safe, you get access to emails that nobody else is cold emailing resulting in better response rates. Plus this gives you access to a bigger list for the same pricing. The main method for validating catch alls is what's known as the Google chips method, where you upload all the catch all emails into a Google sheet and you turn on Google people chips and all the emails that have a people chip are likely to be safe catch alls. And yes, this method works, but it only works on emails under Google. And even then it's still not hundred percent accurate and it might increase your bounce rate a little more than necessary. If you want to validate catch alls, regardless of where the email is registered and have a higher accuracy, I recommend using a tool like Scrubby. Okay. And so even after you verified your leads, 
take all of your catch-alls, upload them to Scrubby, and Scrubby will basically give you back all of those catch-alls that are valid. Um, and to show you an example how the Google Chips method works, like right here we have a list of leads. I would highlight the row of the emails. I would right click, I would go to Smart Chips, convert to people chip and you'll notice some of them it's going to pop up with this profile and so i would do this with my catch-all emails and all the ones where it, where it shows this little profile it means that that this is a, is a safe catch-all email registered with google but it's not going to be 100 percent accurate and it's only going to show us valid catch-alls that are registered under google so obviously you still you still risk having a higher bounce rate because it's not 100 percent accurate but also it's you're missing out on catch-alls that are registered on outlook on zoho um, and other email providers okay um, and so that's where a tool like scrubby comes in so this is by nick abraham he's one of the top guys in the cold email space and, and running a massive b2b lead gen agency uh, and so he built this software uh you know know i think probably a big part of it was to use it internally uh but also he made it a public software right and so you can actually use this to validate all of the catch-alls get back more emails and so if you want to learn more about catch-alls i would recommend you know scrolling through this website watching the videos etc uh, i don't want to spend too much time going into it because again this video is going to be a long one but i would recommend always validating your catch-alls uh, and finding the safe ones so that you email leads that nobody else is emailing and book meetings with people who typically don't receive cold emails and because of that the response rate is way higher and you get a bigger lead list for what you paid for okay uh, and if you want to learn more about that again just go to scrubby.io's website amazing software okay uh next step of the lead you know uh and so at this point you know we verified uh we validated the catch-alls the next step is formatting okay so most people would just upload the lead list straight to their cold email campaign at this point but there's still a few more things left to do that a lot of people don't know about uh and so the first step is to to format all of the company names in your lead list only if you plan on using the company names in your cold email and so for example a lot of the times you're going to use the company name as a variable in your cold email or a lot of the times you know if you're scraping the leads from outscraper your subject line might be question about company name um, and so you want to if you plan on using company name as a variable inside of your cold email you need to be formatting the actual company name um, and so what I mean by this is when you scrape lead lists from Apollo or Outscraper, the company names will often be formatted like this. They'll look like all caps and they'll have LLC, right? So if you scraped us from Apollo, it might look like this, Lead Odyssey LLC, all caps. Or it might look like this, John's Landscaping, Trademark Emoji, Corp, all caps, Dash, Austin, Texas. And so if we just upload these leads in instantly and we're using the company name as a variable in our cold email, it's gonna show it exactly like this, right? It's gonna say, quick question for John's landscaping, trademark, corp, all caps, dash Austin, Texas, or DA contractors, LTD, right? Um, and if you use company names like this in your cold email or subject line, it's gonna appear exactly like that and it's gonna immediately be evident to the prospect that you're just blasting out emails from some software, which is obviously true, but if the prospect believes this, they're gonna be less likely to respond, okay? And if you're sending emails with the company names with like a trademark emoji, that's also hurting your deliverability, okay? And so again, when you scrape leads from these big lead lists, you know, the, the company names, they're not all gonna be cleaned up, right? Some of them are gonna be all caps, some, some of them are going to say co some of them are going to have dashes locations emojis and so you need to actually physically clean the company names uh, and you can either hire a va to do this which is the best option in my opinion uh, or you can use ai softwares to assist you which isn't going to be as accurate um, but as long as you format each company name so that it looks natural in a cold email that's all that matters um, and so if i go to this lead list like if we scroll down right here, you'll see, you know, Kirby Kitchens and Bathrooms Limited. I would literally probably just say Kirby, right? Uh, and if we go right here, TF Building and Renovation Skipton, I would just do TF Building. And that's going to look so much more casual in the cold email. Like we wrote it just for that lead, right? Um, and then something I like to do too is I highlight the whole row. I go to edit, find and replace, and I'll immediately take out LLC, replace all. And it's gonna automatically remove LLC. I'll do LTD 
and it's going to automatically remove that but you have to be careful because it removes it from everything um and so but it's only going to be exactly how you spell it here and so for example if we do corp i don't want to do that because if a company name starts with c-o-r-p it's going to cut it in half okay so this can kind of help you speed run the company name formatting but you do have to be careful um and so typically what you can do is just remove all dashes like all periods all slashes so it just removed 138 periods uh you know you could do slashes like this replace all it just removed 12 and so you can do this to kind of speed run it but you have to be careful typically i would recommend hiring a va on your team who does this when you just have a human doing it and they make every email look like it was you know uh handwritten it's going to significantly increase your results okay but the biggest thing is you know when you scrape leads from apollo the company names are going to look like this where it includes the location there's a dash it says corp in all caps there's a trademark emoji uh, and so for example if i saw this company name in my lead list I would make it so that it just says John's landscaping, right? And then it will be like, and then it will read like, I came across John's landscaping while searching for landscapers in the area versus I came across John's landscaping trademark corp dash tech Austin, Texas while searching for landscapers in the area, okay? Um, and so, you know, I see a ton of people who do this and they're just burning all their leads without cleaning the company name, okay? So you need to be formatting the company name if you plan on using it inside of your actual cold email, okay? Uh, and the second formatting step is finding leads where the location is missing and then filling them in with the area, okay? And so for example, you will potentially be using the city or the state as a personalized variable in your cold email. So something I do a lot of the time if I'm emailing realtors is, you know, hey, hey John, I came across you while looking for realtors in Miami right um, and so but when you scrape leads from Apollo sometimes the city is going to be missing and so if we send an email to that lead it's gonna say hey John I came across you while looking for realtors in space period and it's gonna obviously look like you know either we're stupid or we're just sending out automated cold emails okay um, and so what and you're gonna and this the city and the location is going to be missing for about 20% of your leads. And so if you launch the campaign like this, you're burning 20 to 30% of your leads since part of the cold email is going to be blank. Okay. Um, and so what you do, I've quickly kind of labeled the process here is you just create a filter inside of Google sheets like this. Uh, and so you go to create filter. And if you're targeting the city, you would just click filter clear blanks and so now it's showing me all the leads who have a city missing and as you can see it's a lot of them um, and so if we use the city in our cold email it would show up blank and we would burn all these leads and then all i do is i type in the area and then i just drag it down for all the ones that are missing and i would drag it all the way down to the bottom which again you can see this is a lot of leads i'm not going to go all the way down to the bottom for time's sake but once you get to the bottom you, oh, here we are you just let go and you would move the filter and now all the leads who had a missing location it's going to say the area uh, and what this is going to look like in the cold email is instead of saying you know it's going to read like this I came across John's landscaping while searching for landscapers in the area, right? And so it still makes sense in the context of the cold email. And that way it doesn't just look like this. I came across John's landscaping while searching for landscapers in space period. Okay. Um, and so a lot of your leads aren't going to have the city or location. So make sure you also do that. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be one of the big steps in terms of formatting that a lot of people don't do. Again, it's these small things that add up and help you get the best results possible. Uh, the next one is going to be lead enrichment. Um, and so lead enrichment it's not something i hear many people talk about in the cold email space and it's not required but if you truly want to get the best results possible and gain an edge on the competition i recommend doing what's known as waterfall enrichment um, and so when you go to scrape a lead list from apollo for example your data is not going to be 100 percent accurate and some of the emails and the info might be missing okay um, and so you can use and remember this is what i was talking about earlier sometimes apollo is just guessing on emails sometimes they don't even have the emails um, and so you can use other data vendors to see if they have the missing data and then enrich that so basically adding it into the list that you have okay However, we don't know which lead vendors have the missing data and uploading our lead to every single lead vendors enrichment feature would take too long. Um, and so this is where a software called Better Contacts comes in. Uh, and with the click of a button, they're gonna take our lead list 
automatically enrich it through the top eight lead scraping softwares on the market, looking for the missing data from each one. And so it's API connected to all of these big lead vendors like Apollo, et cetera. Uh, and it's gonna do what's called waterfall enrichment where it literally takes our lead list immediately enriches it on every single popular lead vendor looking for the missing data and the missing emails. And so it gives us significantly more accurate data and missing data. Okay. Uh, and then after enriching the list on each software, it automatically verifies the data. And then on the next software, it looks for the missing data. Okay. Uh, and this allows you to not only access more accurate and complete data, but leads that none of your competitors are emailing. Okay. Um, and so like if I go into Apollo, and for example, if I go to build a lead list, so like we'll just say, for example, real estate agents, and this is a very, you know, this is a very bad, you know, this is a very quick example. Obviously, you would apply more filters, but you'll notice right here, email status. Right now, there's two, there's 224K uh, leads. If I go to the emails that are verified, now like more than half of those leads got cut out, right? Uh, and then another filter is guest emails. And so, you know, this adds a little bit more. So if we, you know, if we don't include any of these filters, and like, for example, if I go to NA, there's 107K leads on Apollo that are real estate agents where the email is missing. So no one else is cold emailing these leads. Um, and so what you can do is instead of including the verified filter, you can leave none of them checked. You can have, you know, you can even have the leads where an email isn't available. Then you can upload it to, to better contacts and it's gonna find all of those missing emails that not many of your competitors are emailing, but it's also gonna give you more data that might've been missing, like the city, uh, like the, the phone numbers, et cetera, which more importantly is accurate data. So maybe you've emailed a real estate agent through Apollo and they told you, hey, I don't actually live in this city. That's because again, the data wasn't accurate. So enrich also allows you to get uh, better and updated data as well as get access to emails that no one else has okay uh, and so I really recommend looking into better contact again I could spend a whole video talking about this and you know this is gonna be a really long video um, already but if you want to learn more about lead enrichment just go to this website and kind of explore around it and watch their content okay um, and so again this isn't necessary but it allows you to access more accurate and complete data but you know, not only does it allow you to access more accurate and complete data, but leads that none of your competitors are emailing. And again, this isn't required, but I'd strongly recommend it because you'll maximize your lead list and get data that nobody else has access to. Okay. Uh, and then part three is going to be actually writing your cold emails. So again, at this point, you know, you, you, uh, you've set up your tech setup correctly, best practices for 2024. You've built an amazing lead list. It's formatted correctly. You've enriched it. Now it's time to write your cold emails. Okay. Um, and so the first step of writing cold emails is making sure you have a cold friendly offer. Okay. And it doesn't matter how good your cold email is. If you don't have what I call a cold friendly offer, um, and a cold friendly offer is an offer that is compelling enough to get the attention of a complete stranger while they're mindlessly scrolling through their inbox filled with hundreds of other offers, okay? And so what a cold friendly offer is, is with paid ads, with cold email, with any type of cold outbound, you're advertising to cold traffic, right? Like paid ads, you're still putting your offer in front of cold traffic. With cold email, you're putting an email in front of cold traffic who's in this zombified state, right? If you're running paid ads and someone's scrolling through Instagram, they're in this zombified state. And so you need a cold friendly offer that it's going to get them out of that zombified state and say a lot without saying much. Okay. Uh, and so it's the same with cold email. You're contacting complete strangers. You need an offer that works on cold traffic. Okay. That can get the attention of a complete stranger. Who's just scrolling through their inbox. Okay. Uh, and so examples of cold friendly offers like real estate agents, get 10 listing appointments or you don't pay remodelers get two bathroom remodels every month or you don't pay mortgage officers get 20 approved loan applications or you don't pay roofers get 16 new roofing replacements per month or you don't pay agency owners get 90 qualified sales calls per month or you don't pay you need to understand that with cold email, you're sending messages to complete cold strangers. You need an offer that will make you immediately stand out without needing to say much to get the highest percentage of them to get on a call with you, okay? Uh, and so there's three steps to creating a cold friendly offer. And again, 
a lot of people, they think they have good offers, but they're terrible and they're losing so much money on cold email. Okay. Um, and so that's why the very first section of the cold email writing training, we're going to be talking about how to make a cold friendly offer that actually resonates with cold traffic. Okay. Uh, and this is the key. Like you could have a terrible cold email and if you have a good cold friendly offer, you're going to book a ton of calls. Okay. Um, and so the first one is a specific avatar. Um, and so you need to create an offer for a specific person. Just saying that you help real estate professionals isn't specific enough to work effectively on cold traffic. You need to choose from real estate agents, loan officers, wholesalers, investors. However, don't get too specific or it will backfire. The key is that the offer resonates with the exact person you're cold emailing. Okay. And so again, you want you don't want to send an email to real estate agents saying we guarantee real estate professionals this this that you know you want to say we guarantee real estate agents right uh, or you don't want to send uh, an email to uh, you know a roofing company we help you get more remote or you don't want to just send a an email saying you know uh, contractors or construction workers you want to say remodelers right and so you want to get somewhat specific not too specific so kind of like I I shown here like real estate agents that's a specific avatar remodelers specific avatar uh, and maybe it might be remodelers and general contractors right it depends on and i'm not too familiar with these niches so i might be saying something stupid right now but the point is you want a specific avatar mortgage officers roofers agency owners etc okay the biggest thing is you don't want to go broad but you also don't want to go too specific where it's like you know agency owners with five years of experience that are that are male and walk their dog at night like you don't want to get that specific okay uh, but you it does need to be a specific avatar to resonate with cold traffic you can't just be selling marketing to everyone if you want cold traffic advertising or marketing to work okay um, and then so a good example that just came to mind is D to C brand owners, right? So direct to consumer brand owners, that's cutting out all drop shippers. Okay. So if you're in the e-commerce niche, instead of saying brand owners, you can say to make it a specific avatar, you can say D to C brand owners, right? Direct to consumer. So for example, uh, and then step two, you need a specific outcome. Okay. Uh, so you need to choose the outcome that the market desires the most. This is where most people fail drastically. Um, and so most people in the real estate niche, have terribly slow growth. I mean, like watching their business grow is like watching paint dry because they're guaranteeing leads or appointments instead of offering the specific outcome that the market desires the most, which is more listing appointments. Okay. Um, and so like, you know, the reason that realtors want sellers more than buyers is because with buyers, they might be driving around town for potentially months until they buy the home that they want. But with listing appointments and sellers, the realtor just shows up to the house, puts the sign in the front yard, goes inside, fills out some paperwork, markets the home, gets it sold. And so they can do more listings per month, allowing them to reach higher commission volumes. Okay. Um, and so every, the majority of realtors prefer listings. That's the specific outcome they want the most. And so if we launch a cold email campaign saying, Hey, we'll guarantee you leads, we'll guarantee you appointments. It's not going to work as well as guaranteeing listing appointments. Okay. So in every niche, there's a specific outcome that the market desires the most. And in real estate, it's listing. So for example, literally like some of the three top agencies in the real estate niche, and you can look this up, Estate AI, right? So Matt Shields, Mescula Media, uh, and then Regain Media, these are like these all these are all the real estate agencies in the agency space or at least three of them doing above 100 200 K per month. They all guarantee 10 listing appointments. Okay, again, success leaves clues. Okay, and so you need to find the specific outcome that your market actually wants. Like if they, not everyone wants leads, not everyone wants appointments. There's a very specific outcome that your market wants, and that's what you need to speak to in your offer. Okay, um, and it's going to be different in every niche, and this is found out through doing niche research. Um, and so another example is remodelers. They specifically prefer bathroom projects as they're faster to complete and less of a headache than kitchen projects, right? And so if you guarantee two bathroom remodelers remodels every month, that's going to resonate more than guaranteeing kitchen projects or appointments, etc. Because what the, the specific outcome they want is more bathroom projects because they're easier to complete and they're less of a headache. And so they can do more of them per month uh, without creating unnecessary complexity and headaches with their with their with their work team, right? Um, and again, I don't know 
too much about the niche, but from what I've heard, that's the specific outcome that they resonate the most with, right? Uh, and so you need to do market research and figure out the exact outcome that your market desires uh, the most in order for your offer to have the highest conversions on cold traffic, right? So if you launch two identical cold emails and one of them says, you know, uh, solar companies will get you this many more leads versus solar companies will get you this many more installs, the install one is going to perform better perform way better because that's the specific outcome that the market actually wants okay so stop destroying your growth by mentioning the mark the the outcome that the market doesn't really want as much as another outcome okay um and again to to work on cold traffic complete strangers you want to mention the outcome that they specifically desire or the majority of the market specifically desires in your cold email okay uh and then you have a risk reversal so you need a risk reversal, okay? You need a risk reversal in order for your cold email to get the highest number of meetings, okay? So again, you're communicating with absolute strangers. You need some type of risk reversal on that specific outcome in order to have the maximum amount of believability, okay? Um, and so most people fail to understand that a risk reversal or guarantee is used at the marketing level, but not at the sales level. And so again, these agency owners who their growth rate is like watching paint dry, I don't want to guarantee listing appointments because I'm going to have to refund them, right? Um, and so what they don't realize is the guarantee is only used at the marketing level and it's not used at the sales level. And so what I mean by this is we use the guarantee in our marketing. We use it in our cold email. We use it in our cold calls. We use it in our cold outreach. Um, and buy, and that's what gets the prospect on the call with us. And by the time the prospect gets on the call, they won't even mention the guarantee or risk reversal, but without it, they would have never responded to our cold email and they certainly would have never agreed to a call in the first place. Now, can you book meetings with cold email without a risk reversal? Absolutely, we do it all the time, but to get the absolute maximum best results and on cold traffic, use a risk reversal, okay? And so there's really three core types of risk reversals. The first one is a money back guarantee. This gets the highest conversions. Uh, and so, you know, this gets the highest conversions. If you can say the words or you don't pay in a cold email, immediately it's gonna do better. I don't use the word guaranteed in cold emails because it's a spam word. We'll talk about that later. Um, and so money back guarantee, this is gonna be the best risk reversal. This only works with conditions though. So if you're just guaranteeing 10 listing appointments without anything required on the client's end, like a minimum amount of ad spend, you know, them having to use the CRM, them having to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, et cetera, it's only going to work if you have a conditional guarantee. So again, this is where it works on the marketing level, but not the sales level. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, the second risk reversal is, or we work for free. And this is good, but in the cold email, you still want to use the word guaranteed. So again, using the word guarantee is technically a spam word, but if you say we'll get you 10 listing appointments or we work for free, it's not going to work as well as saying 10 listing appointments guaranteed, right? And if you work for free, that's still technically a guarantee. So you can use the word guarantee in the marketing to again, have a higher level of people resonating. Okay. Uh, and then you could also do a 30 day satisfaction guarantee. Again, this is still better than nothing, but it's going to be the least powerful. And this is essentially like at the end of the first 30 days, if the client doesn't feel like you're the team to get them to the specific outcome, they get a refund, right? So you could say, you know, uh, real estate agents, we have a way to bring you 10 listing appointments over the next six months. Um, and if you don't feel like we can do it after the first 30 days, you don't pay, right? And so that would be kind of the messaging behind a 30 day satisfaction guarantee. Um, and again, a money back guarantee is always going to be the highest converting risk reversal as being able to say, or you don't pay, which again, you probably see this everywhere on your Facebook feed if you pay attention to, to people's ads, but it still works. Okay. And that's why everyone is still doing it. Um, and or you don't pay helps you immediately stand out on cold traffic. Um, and what most of the top uh, the top guys do. So when you see all these guarantees, like 10 listing appointments, uh, two bathroom remodelers per month, when you see all these bold specific out outcomes, along with or you don't pay, uh, they're typically again, they're used at the marketing level. But on the back end, it has conditions in order for the prospect to even apply for the guarantee. And so for example, these conditions may include 20 to $50 a day minimum ad spend contact all leads within 48 hours, respond to our team within 72 hours, consume all the required training content, 
update the CRM every 48 hours, et cetera, right? And so typically there's a very long list of conditions for that guarantee to even, for that client to even apply for that guarantee, right? Um, and the idea is that you choose conditions that make it unreasonable that the prospect doesn't achieve the desired outcome if they do all of those conditions. Again, you don't wanna get too crazy to this where it's something that they definitely can't do. Uh, like it still has to be within, the conditions still have to be within reason. and. What this does is it allows you to use an extremely powerful guarantee in your cold email without taking on too much risk on your end, right? So if you can say in your cold email, you know, we guarantee to bring you two bathroom project, bathroom remodeling projects in the next 30 days, the cold email is going to perform significantly better. More people are going to get on a call with you, but not all those people might have the minimum ad spend to apply for that guarantee, but they're already on the call and they've already been sold. So they still move forward anyways. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. You don't want to then be talking about the guarantee a ton on the sales call. It's meant to be used at the marketing level to attract more attention. But then in reality, there's conditions to even apply for it, but you don't want to mention that in the cold email because that defeats the purpose. Okay. Um, and so really you just want to put out that guarantee because it is true. That's your guarantee. But what they'll learn in the contract and towards, you know, the, the beginning of them getting onboarded or right before they close is that they do have to do a minimum ad spend and then everything else you say to apply for that guarantee. And then also the timeline might be after two weeks of the ads testing phase. So there's all these different things you can do at the contract level to still protect yourself while using a very bold specific outcome risk reversal. Okay. Um, and so Again, the truth is some prospects won't even be able to apply for the guarantee, but they never would have got on the sales call without it, okay? And this may sound unethical to some people, but it's what all the top guys are doing. And so if you want to compete at that level, I'd recommend doing the same, okay? And I've never seen a prospect get mad at this. Again, most of them will forget about the guarantee by the time they get on the call. But in the worst case scenario, you just downsell them a different guarantee, right? And so if they get on the call and they're about to close and you're like, you're like, and so like, for example, again, the guarantee is used at the marketing level in your cold email to five to 10 X the amount of meetings you book, but then you should rely on your sales process to convert them on the call. Okay. Um, and if they ask about the guarantee on the call, you can just say something along the lines of, yeah, so we guarantee the 10 listing appointments, as long as you invest the minimum ad spend and do all of the work on your end. Right. And typically they're gonna be like, okay, that sounds good. They might say what's required on my end. Then you can list out some of the conditions. But again, the guarantee is used at the marketing level to five to 10 X the amount of meetings that you book. Um, and then that's what gets them on the call. And then you use the sales, you rely on your sales process to actually close them. And again, you don't want to immediately when they get on the call, you don't want to be like, oh yeah, to get the guarantee, you have to do this, that, this, that, this, that, this, uh, again, it's more so used to get them on the call. And then the contract will have the specific conditions. Okay. Um, and so hopefully that makes sense. Again, this is what all the top guys are doing. So when you see these big guarantees on paid ads, they're always going to be conditional. But again, you need to do this in an ethical way where it's not unreasonable for them to do the conditions. But one of them typically is going to be a minimum ad spend. And again, not everyone will be able to apply for that minimum ad spend. And but typically the goal is that they got on the call and you've already sold them because you're good at sales and you have a good sales process where even if they don't apply for the guarantee, they're already sold on the actual process and they still get onboarded anyways. Right. Um, or you can create a downsell guarantee where it's like, look, you don't have the minimum ad spend to apply for the two remodeling projects every month but we can guarantee you one if you do this ad spend, right? And so worst case scenario, if they get pissed, you can downsell them on a different guarantee, uh, but typically you don't even need to. Like if you're good at sales, typically the guarantee shouldn't even be mentioned during the sales call, uh, but that's what got them on the sales call in the first place. And then all you do in the guarantee section of your contract is you have all of the conditions. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so please consult a lawyer on how to organize the conditions or use ChatGPT, wink, wink. Um, but you know, that's, that's what a cold friendly offer is. Okay. Um, and so again, just to recap in order for the cold email to work as effectively as possible, you need a cold friendly offer that works on cold traffic. These are all examples of cold friendly offers. Uh, and to make a cold friendly offer, you need a specific avatar, a specific outcome that the market desires the most combined with a risk reversal. Okay. Uh, and again, this is the first step to creating good cold emails is you need a good offer. Uh, even if you're cold email is amazing. If you're just guaranteeing leads, you're never going to book as many appointments as you should. Okay. Uh, and so I really recommend following that step, even if it makes you nervous. Okay. It will hold you accountable to building an amazing service. Okay. Um, and so 
the first step of actually writing the cold email once you have your cold friendly offer is subject lines okay um, and so the main goal of the subject line is to pique the prospect's curiosity and get them to open the email however remember this is cold email and not email marketing okay i see a ton of people they uh they treat cold email like it's email marketing okay um and so you don't want to do anything salesy or how you would market to your email list okay so so cold email you need to approach it very differently because you're emailing people at a one-on-one -on -one level where email marketing is emailing a list of engaged prospects who have a higher level of awareness at scale okay uh and so the the key distinctions are going to be very different um and so you need to understand that um and so what i try to do with my subject lines is mimic internal emails that are sent within the organizations or company when creating subject line so what this means is not being super formal the less formal the better avoid using capitalization right a good rule of thumb too for subject lines is start with the subject line quick question no caps uh, and use the open rate that you get from quick question as a baseline to then test other subject lines down the road okay so when you launch your first campaign i would recommend just starting with with quick question because it works and then using whatever the open rate is from that to then on your next campaign test against as a baseline and then if you can get above that baseline great stop using quick question and use whatever the new subject line is um, but typically it's just a good rule of thumb to always start with quick question because uh, it does work right so i like doing quick question no caps again to mimic an internal email so that means like what i mean by an internal email is emails that are sent from employee to employee within an organization so typically the subject line is going to be less formal and there's not going to be a lot of capitalization right and if you can mimic an internal email typically you're going to have a pretty good open rate okay but again Again, the you know the the subject line has to be somewhat relevant to what's in the email and so like you don't want to do something like open this for a thousand dollars right you might do that with email marketing and that's totally fine but this is cold email and it's one-to-one -one communication and it's cold prospects who aren't already on your email list and aware of your solution and so we have to you know treat it like that okay and so hopefully that makes sense um, and so you can also try testing personalized variables in your subject lines. This also helps every subject line be different in terms of the characters that are included, which is good for deliverability. Um, so again, I would really just recommend starting with a quick question, no caps, using that as a baseline. But here's an example of top performing subject lines that we've used and have worked very well. So obviously the first one, quick question, no caps. The next one, first name dash quick question no caps and so the same thing all we did was enter a, a personalized variable so the first name um, and again this can help having a personalized variable but then you have to ask yourself if i was emailing one of my employees would i really put his first name in the subject line right and so you have to also ask yourself that uh, you can do first name thoughts or you can literally just do thoughts no caps literally just thoughts question mark again if you were to just email a friend or an employee that's how that's what you might use as a subject line you might not use their first name uh question for first name or you can just do question right like again that's something you would do if you're emailing an employee okay uh question about company name um and so for example if the leads are from outscraper you're not going to have the leads first name and so you might have to say question about company name um and you can do you know first name question mark right and that also works so these are all good examples of subject lines and pretty much all these subject lines can also be done without the first name and so for example you can just do thoughts with no first name you can literally just do question with no first name again you can do question with no company name uh and then you could literally just do question mark actually i wouldn't just do question mark you could it might work um and, and again it's it's just about mimicking an internal email and that's typically like a good guideline for for your subject lines okay again don't overthink this step just start with quick question no caps to get a baseline open rate and you can test against that baseline later down the road uh, and then if the leads are from outscraper then use question about company name okay so again with outscraper you might not, or you could just do quick question as well but if you want to include a personalized variable from the outscraper leads I would just do company name uh, or just quick question no caps okay um, and so 
knowing the subject line, you know, now we'll kind of go into the anatomy of a cold email. Um, and so really the framework that I follow, this is like the most effective and easiest framework in my opinion. It's as you're going to learn later, it's not the only way to write cold emails, but it's a very simple and effective framework that gets really good results and is relatively easy to craft. Okay. Um, and so what the anatomy of this framework looks like is I'm typically writing three to four line cold emails that are relevant fit on an iPhone screen. And so 70% of emails are gonna be opened on mobile. And so if you send a test cold email to yourself and it doesn't fit on your iPhone screen, it's gonna hurt your, your readability, okay? And again, if it, if it goes below the fold, Right. So the same way when you're doing email marketing or building landing pages, you want the CTA to be above the fold, which is if you open it on an iPhone screen, is it above the fold? Right. Um, and so you, the, you want your cold email. You want the CTA to be above the fold. If it's not, it's going to look like you have this very long email. Not as many people are going to read it. Right. But again, cold email is very different from email marketing. Um, and so we want it to be short, relevant, straight to the point. It should fit on an iPhone screen. 70% of people open that email on mobile. So the CTA should be above the fold, like above the bottom of the phone. Uh, and it should just be straight to the point, right? A lot of people overcomplicate cold emails. It's really not that hard. A lot of people make them way too long. They just talk about themselves. Uh, and it's really just supposed to be relevant, fit on an iPhone screen and talk about the prospect two times as much as we talk about ourselves. Okay. Um, and so these emails are broken into the sections below. Uh, and so the first section of the cold email is what I call the opener. Okay. So that's the first line in the cold email. The second line is what I call the body. Uh, and then, you know, the third line optional, if you have a case study, you can add it or you can, the body can be a case study, right? That's not required. But if you do have a case study, you can include it as the third line. Uh, the fourth is going to be the call to action. And the fifth is going to be the signature. Okay. So it's a very simple framework and it's very effective. We've used it across 20 successful campaigns in five to 10 different industries. Okay. Um, and I will break down how to write all five sections and then show you how to put them all together. Okay. Uh, and so starting with section number one, which is going to be the opener. Okay. Um, and so cold email openers are the first sentence in the cold email and they always act as a second subject line. Okay. And so what I mean by this is, you know, when a prospect opens one of your emails they're you know, or when they go to open one of your emails, Gmail is going to show them a preview of the first sentence, right? So if you open your inbox right now, you not only are you going to see the subject line of all the emails, but you're actually going to be able to see a preview of the opener. Okay. And so if the opener is something that's very salesy or it's talking about ourselves, this is going to deter away the prospect from opening it. And it's going to trigger that automated side of their brain that just adds the email to spam. Okay. Um, and so you also want to keep in mind that the opener is also the second subject line. Okay. Um, and then a good opener should convey to the prospect that the email was written just for them, even if it really wasn't, okay? So you wanna ask yourself when you're writing the opener. Now, in 2024, I do not recommend writing personalized first lines, okay? I just don't. They don't work as well as they used to. Uh, and you know, we've tested it and we've literally, from the, the openers that I'm gonna show you that are just semi-personalized using information that we already have from the leads, it literally performs the same, okay? And we've tested this. and. Even, you know, so the opener, I actually don't recommend doing some type of personalized first line unless it's actually relevant to the prospect, okay? But typically, if you get a first line writer or like the only software that's kind of good is quick lines, and even then, quick lines, I would just include that personalization line in the PS section if you're gonna use it, okay? But again, you do not need personalized first lines in 2024. And actually your cold email might perform worse if you do. Okay. So this is something that we've tested a lot. Yes. You can use ChatGPT to write first lines. Again, we tested this, the results were still worse than doing what I'm about to show you. Okay. Um, and so a good opener should convey to the prospect that the email is written just for them, even if it wasn't, but it doesn't have to be a personalized compliment. You just need to ask yourself this. Okay. Um, and so try to make it as relevant as possible to the prospect who's going to be reading it because relevance is the key to to good cold emails. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to show you examples of uh, top cold email openers that we've actually used in top performing campaigns. And you know, from this, you'll get a pretty good idea of what a good uh, cold email opener or first line looks like. Uh, and you have a ton of examples you can use to make your own. Okay. And what you're going to notice is oftentimes we're using one or two personalized variables that are already available to us, such as the company name, the location, or the amount of reviews they have on Google, which we get from Outscraper. Okay. Um, and so for example, first opener, 
I came across you while searching for realtors in Miami, right? When I was in the real estate niche and I scaled up to eight, 10K per month, every email I sent, this is the first line that I used, okay? Literally just, I came across you while searching for realtors in Miami, right? And if a realtor sees the preview of this in an email, they might think I'm a potential client, right? That's very relevant to them. Um, and you know, they can imagine that it might be written just for them, okay? Um, and so literally just saying, I came across you while searching for realtors in Miami. I came across you while looking for lawyers in Miami, right? And so came across you while looking for divorce attorneys in Miami. Uh, if a divorce attorney sees that in the top of their email, they're gonna open it, okay? And it's gonna look semi-personalized. Um, and so again, a lot of the times we're just using the city as the opener, okay? And it's relevant. We're telling them how we actually found them, right? Uh, here's another example. So again, this first line, I uh, I used this for like a year for ourselves and a ton of clients. And I noticed that it, the performance slowly started going down. So I decided to switch up the opener in the real estate niche. And we started using this. As a real estate agent in Miami, I imagine you're always looking for ways to generate more seller opportunities, right? So again, we're using the city as a personalization point, but we're relating to them, right? We're saying, I imagine you're always looking for ways to generate more seller opportunities because remember, that's the desired outcome that they want, right? Um, and so that works really well as a you know title in location. I imagine you're always looking for ways to, and then whatever your service does, right? So that's a good example of an opener. Uh, was searching for the top auto detailers in North Northridge and came across endless summer detailing. Dash, congrats on the five star rating, right? So again, the person reading this might just think that we are looking for a detailer in our city and we found them and then we saw the good rating, right? Um, and so this uses three personalized variables, was searching for top auto detailers in the city and came across company name, congrats on the and then five star rating, which is whatever their rating was on Google that we got with the lead on Outscraper, okay? Um, and so that works really well. Uh, you could also do, you know, was searching for top lawn care companies in Boston and came across True Green's website. You guys have some great reviews, right? And so again, this is just, you know, it still seems personalized, but we're really just sending the same exact opener to every lead on the list, right? Um, but again, it still seems like it could be written just for them, right? And trust me, these are all openers that have been from winning campaigns, okay? Uh, the next one was searching for gyms here in San Diego and came across Planet Fitness, right? Um, and so you can say, for example, you're in the gym niche or, or whatever niche you're in, you can scrape all the leads in your city and you can use that to personalize the opener by adding the word here, right? And so obviously you can still use this opener without the word here. And so it can read like, was searching for gyms, uh, was searching for gyms in San Diego and came across Planet Fitness. That still works, but simply adding the word here, it's very powerful, right? And so you can scrape specifically a list of leads in your local area uh, and then use the word here in the opener. So it was searching for gyms here in San Diego and came across Planet Fitness, right? So Planet Fitness would obviously just be the gym's name, which you get from the lead source. Uh, another one, this one absolutely ripped. This opener was part of an email where we booked meetings with five, seven, and $20 million estimated annual revenue home improvement companies. Um, and so for example, Notice you play a major role in remodeling pros marketing efforts. I imagine you're always looking for ways to maximize the budget, right? And so this is an email that we sent to all marketing directors. So again, it's relevant to them. They play a major role in company names, marketing efforts. I imagine you're always looking for ways to maximize the budget, right? That's what the marketing related uh, department is trying to do is maximize the marketing budget, right? And our service can help them solve that, okay? Um, and so that's an opener that absolutely ripped. Uh, another one, we've used this uh, with, with agency owners who are selling B2B lead gen. You know, uh, if you're an agency owner or if, say for example, you're selling to a home improvement company and you used to be a home improvement company founder, you can use that in the opener to your advantage to make it more relevant. Uh, or if you're an agency owner and you're also selling to agency owners, you can use that in the opener to make it more relevant, right? So for this example, as a fellow agency owner, comma, I imagine you're always looking for ways to fill up your calendar with more sales calls, right? So again, as a fellow agency owner, then we're relating to them. Uh, another example, as the founder of a SaaS company, 
I imagine you're always looking for ways to hire experienced SDRs, right? And obviously this has to be relevant to your service. So if I was, if I had a, a sales recruitment company where I was placing trained SDRs, this would be a very appropriate opener, right? If I was placing SDRs for SaaS companies. Um, and so again, it's still like, keep in mind with these openers, they have to be relevant to the rest of the cold email, which we'll talk about that when we're kind of putting everything together. Um, but it's important to know that, okay? Uh, another example was searching for the top solar companies in Kingman and came across Soul Life. Keep up the great work, right? So was searching for the top solar companies in city. And here's a little trick. Whenever you're mentioning uh, a location in your cold email, always use the city. I see a lot of people, they use like the state. It's like, it's just less realistic, right? Like if it's, I was searching for gyms in California and came across Planet Fitness, it's like California is very big, right? Or I was searching for gyms in Texas. No, you want to be like, I was searching for gyms in Austin, right? Um, and so if you use their city, it's going to be much more realistic. And remember, if you format the leads correctly, like I showed you, it will say was searching for top solar companies in the area and came across Soul Life if the city is missing, right? So even if you don't have the city for all of them, that's totally fine. But I would always use the city variable instead of state. It's just so much more realistic if you're actually emailing that person, right? Um, and then the final one. So this one works pretty well. Uh, and so was scrolling through Facebook and came across one of company names ads, right? And so this is where if you if you uh, if you build a lead list of people who are using the Facebook pixel as a technology, you know that there's a good chance that they're running ads, right? Um, and so again, this seems like it was written just for that person. Are some of those leads going to say I'm not running Facebook ads? Yes, but a lot of them probably are if you do the targeting correctly. And so this can be a very relevant opener. Okay. Um, and so Again, these are all examples of openers. You'll notice we're not doing any eye rolling irrelevant compliments. They're all relevant and we're just using small personalized variables that we already have access to. Okay. Um, and so that's how you write the opener. And so the next anatomy, you know, the next section of the cold email is going to be the body. Okay. So after you write the opener, then we want to write the body. Um, and so after the prospect reads the opener, we want to give them context on exactly what we can do for them. Okay. That's all you need to do in the opener. I see a ton of people, they start telling a story about themselves. They just start talking all about themselves. I can do this, I can do that, I can do this. We offer this, that, this, that. We literally just want to tell the prospect exactly what we can do for them, okay? What can we do for them? We don't wanna talk about ourselves. Um, and we wanna show them in as little words as possible, okay? Um, exactly why they should respond to our cold email. And this is where the cold friendly offer, this is where this becomes very easy. Uh, Cause if you guarantee a very high level outcome that the market wants, it's very easy to communicate that in a very few words, okay? Um, and so again, a good cold email is gonna be short, relevant and straight to the point. And so that's why we want to communicate what we can do for them in as little words as possible for the body. Okay. And really why they should even respond to our cold email in the first place. So telling them all about ourselves, that's not going to be a good reason for them to respond. They don't care about us. They're a complete stranger. What can we do for them? Right. And so that's where the cold friendly offer becomes very important. Okay. And so the body is really just going to always be presenting your cold friendly offer and positioning it in a way that makes the prospect want to learn more about how it works, eliciting a response. Again, having a risk reversal will 10 X your results. Okay. So like we've tested this so much. We're like adding the words guaranteed or you don't pay. Like if you, if you AB split tested one email that just said the high level outcome and the other one said, or you don't pay or guaranteed massive difference. Okay. It's actually kind of scary. Um, and so again, you want to have a risk reversal. Okay. And make sure that your offer is easily quantifiable, a specific result in a specific time frame. Okay. So ideally you want it to be easily comprehensible and easily quantifiable. Um, and so you don't want to say, you know, we'll help you, uh, you know, we'll, trying to think of a bad example, like just saying, we'll get you more appointments, right? No, you want to say, or, or we'll get you more listings. No, you want to say, we'll get you 10 specific number listing appointments, right? Describing it more in the next six months, specific time frame, right? Um, and so a specific, and like when you're doing the copy, you want to be using a specific result in a specific time frame, okay? Um, and so understanding your, your current market's level of sophistication and awareness if needed, you may need to position your mechanism as unique and over and avoid overused keywords. Okay. And so 
If the market is constantly hearing Facebook ads, avoid using keywords related to Facebook ads and create your own mechanism when you're writing your body, okay? Uh, and so you can learn more about this by reading about you know Eugene Swartz levels of market sophistication and breakthrough advertising. Every marketer should be required to read that book. Um, but for example, if you know your niche is sick of hearing Facebook ads, instead of saying Facebook ads in your cold email, so instead of saying our Facebook ads system will bring you 10 listing appointments or you don't pay, you can say, we have a way to bring you 10 listing appointments using our seller attraction system or you don't pay, right? So seller attraction system is a unique mechanism. If you are in a sophisticated market, you could use that uh, when you're writing your body instead of saying like Facebook ads. Or you could just say, we have a way to bring you 10 listing appointments over the next six months or you don't pay, right? Uh, but you can also test adding in a unique mechanism depending on your market's level of sophistication. Or if everyone is selling Facebook ads to realtors and you're one of the only few people who sells YouTube ads, kind of like Regain Media did, uh, you would want to say, we have a way to bring you 10 listing appointments through our YouTube ad system or you don't pay, okay? Um, and so you can also sometimes play around with uh, introducing a mechanism when you're describing your offer in the body. You don't have to include a mechanism, but if depending on your levels of market sophistication, you might need to introduce a mechanism that's unique or uncommon, okay, to, to really grasp their attention. If they're used to hearing the claim that is your cold friendly offer, okay? So again, recommend looking into Eugene Swartz, markets level sophistication, that will probably make more sense when you do. Uh, but moving on, I've found that using specific numbers to describe your cold friendly offer actually can make it seem more realistic and easier to comprehend to the prospect. So for example, we had a campaign where we actually said seven listing appointments instead of 10. Even though this number is actually lower, real estate agents are so used to seeing the 10 listing appointments guarantee that when they see the number seven, it's kind of like this random number that not a lot of people use and it almost captures their attention more, right? Um, it almost makes it easier to comprehend and it almost makes it seem like we're using a specific example, right? Um, and so if you look at a lot of E-Man's videos, it's top seven tips for XYZ, top seven pieces of advice. And, and so he's not everyone else is doing top five or top 10, but E-Man is doing top seven, right? Um, so this also works just in general for writing YouTube uh, titles, etc. cetera. Um, and so another example was we said, we'll bring you 52 in-home appointments instead of just saying 50, right? Um, and so this actually comes from the book, Scientific Advertising. Uh, and so I really recommend reading that book too. A lot of these OG marketing and, and advertising books are gonna be very relevant to you, uh, even in cold email. Um, but you know, using specific numbers, it makes the claim more believable to the user, almost to the point where it's easier to comprehend, okay? Um, and so most people use common numbers to describe their offer, like five, 10, 20. So a lot of the times they're gonna use an even number, but being oddly specific adds a level of realism to the claim. Like it's from a specific real life example or case study, even if it's not, right? Um, and so for example, simply by us saying, we'll bring you 52 in-home appointments instead of saying 50, again, 52 is like the specific number. It makes it easier for the prospect to comprehend. It stands out more and it kind of communicates that we might be referring to a specific case study where we got someone 52 in-home appointments instead of 50, even if we didn't, right? Um, and so that's just something I found through testing is that using specific numbers, it can sometimes actually perform a lot better than just using the same numbers that everyone else uses that are typically rounded up or even numbers. Okay. Um, and then the, the final piece of kind of advice for writing the body is simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. Okay. I see a lot of people, they try to make their offer sound as, you know, like, uh, as like intense as possible and as like as technical and advanced as possible but then it just becomes harder to understand and the and the prospect can't comprehend it and they ignore it because they don't understand it. But if it's sim like, I don't know how to explain it, but like when we write pitches, right? Like, so I got this from Cole Gordon, we go through a lot of his sales stuff. And you know, he said, when you're writing your pitch, like simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. And I've kind of found this to be very true when you're writing the body of your cold email, okay? From it being simplicity, from it being simple, it, 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 it communicates sophistication, if that makes sense, okay? Um, and so don't try to make it sophisticated, try to make it simple, and as a result, it becomes sophisticated, okay? Um, and so these are top performing body examples. So again, uh, next to the top performing opener examples, these are bodies that we use in real campaigns that got good results, okay? And so the first one, 
We can get 57 paid trials to come into your gym for a workout next month using our end-to-end -end lead nurturing process, dash, or you don't pay, right? And so this is an example of a top performing body. We're literally just presenting the offer so we can get 57 paid trials. So 57 specific number, paid trials, specific outcome, outcome to come into your gym for a workout, making it easier to understand next month, right? So basically saying within 30 days, using our end to end lead nurturing process. And so that's the unique mechanism. We're like, okay, well, what's the end to end lead nurturing process peaking their curiosity or you don't pay, that's the risk reversal, okay? This is a good body. Next one, we help agents like yourself get an extra seven listing appointments every five months, guaranteed, okay? Again, we're just presenting the offer in an as simple way as we possibly can. So we help agents, specific avatar, like yourself, comparing it to them, get an extra seven, not 10, seven listing appointments. Listing appointments is the specific outcome every five months. So five months is the specific time frame guaranteed is the risk reversal, okay? So again, that's a really solid body. Uh, we have a way to bring you 16 solar installs over the next 30 days, dash, or you don't pay. Again, this, and like you might be thinking, Jackson, this is so simple, this, this can't work. I promise you, this is what works, right? Is you're literally just saying exactly what you can do for the prospect using all of the principles that we just talked about, and this is what really works for the body, okay? And again, we don't wanna talk about ourselves, we don't wanna try to explain too much, we wanna tell them what we can do for them in as little words as possible with as little risk on their end as possible, okay? Um, and so, again, we have a way to bring you 16 solar insoles over the next 30 days or you don't pay, right? We have a way to bring you 16 specific number solar installs this the desired outcome over the next 30 days time frame or you don't pay risk reversal right so literally just one sentence that's all you need for a good body okay again we want it to fit on a mobile screen um and that's really the whole goal okay and so you don't want to go off talking about yourself for five sentences it's going to get you very low reply rates okay like like three to five percent depending on the niche um and so another good example we can sell you 20 more used cars each month using our car dealership accelerator system or you don't pay, right? So 20, that's the number. Uh, used cars sales, that's the outcome. You know, each month, that's the specific time frame, so it's quantifiable. Using our car dealership accelerator system, unique mechanism, or you don't pay, right? Uh, and so if car detailers, if they're super uh, overwhelmed with Facebook ads, Google ads, etc. We, we're calling it our car dealership accelerator system, right? It sounds stupid, but it's it's just unique and they're gonna be curious. Well, what's the car dealership accelerator system, right? And so read more about unique mechanisms. There is power to them, okay? Another example, we can book 15 meetings on your sales reps calendar each month and you only pay per booked meeting that shows, right? So again, that's the risk reversal is that it's on a performance basis per meeting that shows, right? And so this is another way to describe that offer. And again, you'll see, we said 15, the one before we said 20, you don't have to use a specific number every time, but it is something that you can kind of test. And I have seen it in some examples, significantly increase results, okay? Uh, another example, we have a way to bring you 10 listing appointments over the next six months, guaranteed, right? So again, the we have a way typically works very well from what I've seen. Uh, another example, we can bring you two bathroom remodeling projects over the next 30 days or you don't pay, right? Again, we're just stating the cold friendly offer in as little words as possible, okay? So typically, again, simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. Do not overthink this. These are all from winning campaigns that, you know, added 5, 10, you know, uh, 12, 13K of monthly recurring revenue, okay? Um, and so these are all proven bodies again this stuff works okay um and so this is what you would do for the body okay so now you've learned how to do the opener you've learned how to do the body uh the next step is going to be writing the call to action okay uh, and so the cta is the last line of the cold email and it should really just give the prospect a clear next step as to what they have to do to learn more about the offer that you presented to them in the body, okay? Um, and always make sure that the CTA is a question that can easily be answered and is low risk to the prospect. Um, and so for example, if you're asking the prospect to meet on a 45 minute Zoom call, that's high risk for the prospect, right? That's 45 minutes of their time they may never get back and a Zoom call is a larger commitment than a phone call, okay? Um, and so a lower risk CTA 
would be asking for permission to send more info or to have a quick five minute phone call, right? And so those are lower risk to the prospect. And so if we're just straight out the gate asking them for 45 minutes of their time on a Zoom call, that's high risk, right? Again, that's 45 minutes of their time they may not ever get back. Uh, and a Zoom call is higher commitment. So if we just ask like, hey, can I send more info about this? It's very low risk for them to say yes, right? Um, and so we're gonna get more positive leads that way. If we say, any interest in connecting on a quick five minute phone call to learn more, that's low risk, right? It's it's on the phone, it's less commitment, it only takes five minutes, and so you're gonna have a much higher throughput, and then that next step after they reply, that's where you can book them in for that main Zoom call once they're already committed, okay? Um, and then kind of another key distinction for the CTA is, do not make the prospect feel pressured to book a call. Even with a cold friendly offer, you still are a complete stranger who emailed them, okay? So the prospect should not feel pressured to get on a call with you because again, they're still a complete stranger and you need to understand this, okay? Um, and then the, the next thing is always make sure that the CTA flows with the opener in the body. Um, and so what I like to do is read it out loud myself, okay? So the entire cold email should flow together and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they should all, you know, your opener, your body and your CTA should all flow well together and remain relevant, okay? Um, and so what I like to do is send, like when I'm writing a cold email, I'll literally send it to my own inbox and I'll open it and what this does is it puts myself in the prospect's shoes. Um, and so this should say, you know, shoes. Uh, it puts myself in the prospect's shoes. And then do I, I ask myself, does this email make sense, right? Uh, like if I was the prospect and I just opened this in my inbox, does it fit on the iPhone screen? Does it flow well together? Uh, and typically just the act of doing that, you can notice some very obvious changes you might need to make. Uh, but also, again, you want to make sure that that CTA flows with the rest of the email, okay? Uh, and then one of my favorite CTAs is just mind if I send more info uh, because it's extremely low risk and it gets a high throughput of interested leads. Okay. Um, and so again, like uh, CTA that we use like 80% of the time is just mind if I send more info. It's very low risk for the prospect to say yes to that. We're not asking for any of their time. We're just asking for a yes or a no. And this gives us a very high throughput of interested leads. And once you have an interested lead, it's much easier to then get them on the call. Okay. Um, and using a soft CTA like mind if I send more info, it's going to allow you to get a higher throughput of, of positive responses and test and validate cold email angles and offers faster and get better results if you're in a saturated market. Okay. So using a soft CTA, like mind if I send more info, if you put that under your new cold friendly offer that you're trying to test out, um, you know, that can essentially, you know, allow you to test that offer faster because it's going to get way more positive responses than going straight for the meeting. And that just gives you the insight of whether the offer is, is working or not. Okay. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and then it's important to understand that there's three core types of CTAs. So you're going to have a hard CTA, which goes straight for the meeting. You're going to have a soft CTA, which asks for permission to send more info. Uh, and then you're going to have a value CTA, which asks for permission to share something of value, such as a video or a sales asset related to the offer that you presented in the body. Okay. Uh, and so I'll give you winning examples of, of the three different types of CTAs. So the hard CTA, this is where you're going straight in for the meeting. So an example, are you interested in learning more? Are you open to learning more? Do you have 12 minutes for a call this week? Uh, are you open to a quick call to discuss this further? Would it make sense if we meet sometime this week to talk this through? Any interest on connecting in a call to learn more? Any interest in hearing how the system works, right? So if the body said, we'll help you get 10 listing appointments through our seller attraction system, if we wanna use a hard CTA, one that might flow well with that body is, you know, again, uh, we have a way to bring you 10 listing appointments through our seller attraction system or you don't pay any interest in learning how the system works, right? And so that flows well with that body. Another example might be open, open to discussing how we can do the same for you, question mark. Uh, open to exploring this further, question mark. Uh, how does Monday suit you for a quick chat, right? Um, and through through liquid spin tax, you can automatically set the date that it says to be the next, the next day. Uh, that's an advanced cold email thing. Don't worry about that. But 
How does Monday suit you for a quick chat? That's gonna look a little more personalized if you're using the next day of the week, which you can do through Liquid Syntax. Um, just Google Liquid Syntax. We'll talk about it later though. Uh, is this worth exploring for company name, right? So you could even use the company name in the call to action, right? Uh, you know, uh, we can bring you an additional two remodeling projects every month through our remodel growth firm system, or you don't pay. Is this worth exploring for Joe's remodeling? Question mark, right? Uh, soft CTA examples. So again, this is my all time favorite. Mind if I send more info? Um, mind if I share more info about how this works? Do you mind if I send more information on this? Would you like more info before we put something on the calendar? Uh, value CTA examples. Would you like to see a quick video explaining further? Mind if I send a quick video explaining the system? Uh, mind if I send a quick loom on this? Mind if I send a quick video explaining how we can implement this for company name? I made a Google doc on how we implement this. Cool if I share it. I made a one pager on this offer. Cool if I send it. I made a resource on this. Mind if I share it with you, right? So the value CTA is obviously, again, it's a way to kind of stand out. And instead of just asking them to respond, to book a call or get more info about the offer, you're offering to send them a video about the offer again, which is a value-based CTA. Uh, and for example, instead of just doing cold looms to absolute strangers, making personalized videos for people who have no idea you exist, that's going to be a complete waste of time. But instead, what you can do is launch a cold email campaign, make the call, call to action, Mind if I send a quick video explaining how we can implement this for company name? And then once people actually say yes, who are actually interested in the offer, you can then make the video or you can just have an evergreen video, right? Um, and so there's a lot of ways you can go about the call to actions. Personally, I really like using soft call to actions. Uh, sometimes if the offer is really good and the niche, if it makes sense in the niche, I'll do a hard CTA and just go straight for the meeting. Uh, but a lot of the times I'm using mind if I send more info and then once, and then that gives me a very high throughput of positive leads that in the next response, when I give them the more info, I can then go with a hard call to action to book the call and I'll be able to follow up with them and I'll have more leads to follow up with, if that makes sense, okay? Uh, whereas the value CTA, this if you wanna experiment different things, this can work very well. Uh, and then in the email that you send them the video, you can include a call to action as well as a call to action in the actual video. So there's a lot of ways you can go around CTAs, right? Uh, but as long as you understand these key principles and the three different types and these examples, you should have everything you need to start trying different CTAs. Again, I would recommend just starting with mind if I send more info. It's very easy. It's very simple. It will allow you to figure out how well the cold email and the offer is performing very quickly. Then you can always change it later to a hard CTA and look at the baseline drop in ABR. Okay. Um, and then next part of the cold email after the CTA is going to be the signature. So without a signature, it's hard for the prospect to trust you based on a random cold email, right? Um, and so having an optimized signature, it shows that you're a real person um, and that they could Google you and your company if they wanted, okay? Um, and so adding a phone number to your signature will occasionally result in interested leads who skip responding to the cold email and they just call you, right? Um, and so we've seen that by adding a, you know, by adding a phone number in our signature, we'll literally get leads who just straight up call us, okay? Um, and so, you know, not only does it give you authority and make you seem like a, more of a real person, but you'll literally get leads who don't want to go back and forth over email and they just end up calling you and, and then you can kind of push them to a meeting. Okay. Um, and so we've had a ton of clients book meetings that way, just by leads calling them. Uh, you, what I also recommend doing is adding a link to your calendar in the signature for interested prospects who don't want to waste time going back and forth over email. Um, and, and so what this looks like is literally saying, let's chat and then hyperlinking a link to book a call with you, okay? Um, and then if you have a small following on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Instagram, you can link that social media in your signature to increase your credibility and authority, okay? Um, and so what I mean by this is if you have if you have a decent following on LinkedIn or if you post relevant niche content on LinkedIn, uh, and, and again, this will give you more authority and make you seem like a, more of a real person, you can say, let's connect on LinkedIn in your signature and have it linked to your, to your LinkedIn, right? Or if you post niche related content on YouTube, you can put the bottom of your signature, check out my YouTube content, exclamation point, and hyperlink it to YouTube, okay? Um, and so, 
Again, adding a business address and phone number, this also tells Google and the prospect that you're likely a real person and not a scammer, right? Uh, because a scammer, they're not gonna include a city and a zip code. Uh, and so when Google identify, or when the email service providers uh, identify a, you know, uh, a city and a zip code in your signature, it helps your deliverability and it makes the prospect, you know, think that you're more of a real person, right? Because again, you're still a stranger sending them a cold email. Uh, and so the signature framework that I use is full name, company role. So like founder, account manager, uh, SDR, the company name, and then in the where and then where it says the company name, you're gonna hyperlink it to your website. Uh, and then below that you put let's chat. So again, some people don't wanna go back and forth over cold emails, so you wanna give them the option to just book a call with you. Um, and so you just put let's chat, exclamation point, and then hyperlink it to your Calendly. Uh, your phone number, again, if someone just wants to call you and to make it look more real, like a real person, your city and your zip code, uh, and then your YouTube or your LinkedIn if you post you know, content on there. So an example, Jackson Williams, founder, uh, lead odyssey, you know, it's going to be hyperlinked to either a landing page or a company website. Uh, and then let's chat, you know, this is going to go straight to a Calendly link. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to go straight to basically a booking page like this, where it says let's chat. Um, and so you should have a dedicated, you know, booking page, not just a Calendly that looks the same as everyone else's. Uh, so custom color, etc. cetera, uh, the phone number, you know, the city and the zip code. Uh, and then for example, let's connect on LinkedIn and it goes to my LinkedIn profile, right? Um, or I could say, you know, check out my YouTube and hyperlink the YouTube channel that you're watching a video from right now. Um, and if you have a decent YouTube following, you should definitely do this. It's going to give you a lot of authority in your outreach. Um, and now a key distinction is when you're including signatures in your email, you need to be doing it at, at in the signature settings. Okay. So you need to be going, you need to be going, uh, select all, and then you need to go to bulk edit settings and, and paste the signature right here. Okay. Um, and so you're going to want to just paste the signature right there. Looks like it didn't copy over. Um, but you would just, you know, copy this and you would include the signature right here instead of actually just like typing it in the cold email. Um, and this is going to add it in the actual signature section. Okay. Um, and so you would do this, then you would press save. Uh, and then when you're writing the cold email, all you would do is just go to sequences, uh, go to variables, signature, and then it's automatically going to include it, okay? Um, and so that's the way you wanna actually add the signatures into your emails, okay? But it's important that you structure your signatures like this, again, for all the reasons that we kinda talked about, okay? Um, and so the next section is gonna be adding case studies, okay? Um, and so, yeah, this video is gonna be a long one. And I've been doing this all in one sitting, by the way, I'm not edit, I don't edit any of this out. I've been, I've been, this is all in one sitting, but moving on, you know, to adding case studies. Um, and so, you know, oh, so yeah, so really quick, like this video, I've been sitting here the past like two or three hours filming this. I don't know where we're at right now. Uh, and we still have a ton more to cover. So if you appreciate this, you're getting value, uh, please drop a like and subscribe. You know, obviously I'm, I'm putting a lot of my time into this. Um, and so I'd really appreciate it if you could help this video get to more people by liking liking and subscribing and commenting. Uh, and I really do appreciate it. Okay. Uh, and so back to the video, you know, adding case studies to your cold email is an easy way to separate yourself from the competition and increase that booking rate. Okay. Um, and so if you have them, I 100% recommend using them in some part of your cold email sequence. Um, and so you can either put the case study as the body after the body or in the PS section or you can use it in one of your follow-ups, okay? Uh, and so these are really the different places that you can insert a case study in your cold email sequence. So you could just, as the body literally could just be your uh, your case study, you could put it after the body, uh, or you could include it in the PS section, or you can use it as one of your follow-ups. And there's really no best place to put it as long as you include a case study, okay? Um, and so if you have them, you should be using them because it's gonna differentiate yourself from all the other cold emails the prospect is getting, okay? Uh, and so you really just wanna make sure that it's a relevant case study and that it flows with the rest of the cold email. So for example, what I mean by relevant is it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be from a different avatar than who the cold email is targeting, okay? Um, and so make sure that the case study is tangible and it includes a specific end result, something that the prospect can easily easily visualize and understand, okay? So again, you shouldn't say you know we helped this person do this. It should be you know you know we helped John you know get this result in this time frame, right? And so it should be a tangible case study, include a specific end result and something that the prospect can easily visualize. So you shouldn't say, 
we help John book more appointments. Like that's not very tangible or visual. Uh, and so what you should say is something like, you know, uh, we helped John Brecken, a real estate agent in Ohio, close $267,000 worth of GCI in the first seven and a half months of working with us, right? That's a very tangible and specific case study and I can visualize it, okay? Um, and so here's the first example of using a case study. So this is gonna be using it in the body. Um, so for example, in this example, you essentially just use a relevant case study as the body of the cold email, okay? So kind of forget the, the body examples that we went over before. And instead of using these, you'll just use a case study like this. Okay. Hey, first name. I just came across you while searching for realtors in Miami. Uh, and there's supposed to be a space here. My keyboard died, so I can't add it, but just know there's supposed to be a, fit, a space between the opener and the body. Uh, but I just came across you while searching for realtors in Miami, just reaching out because our listing accelerator system recently helped Mario Avalos, right? So we're giving the name of our client to where if they actually search up that name, it's going to show a real realtor. So that's key. You don't want to, you don't want to just say that your client's first name, you want to put their full name, assuming your client's okay with it. So if they wanted to, they could verify the case study and that's going to get you more responses. Okay. A local realtor in Miami. So again, very specific, very tangible case study close seven new listings in the first 20 weeks of working with us. Oh, and then the call to action is open to, open to learning how we can help you do the same. So see how again, the call to action should always be relevant to the body. Um, and so since the, the body is a case study, we're gonna use that to our advantage in the CTA, open to learning how we can help you do the same, right? Uh, and so the, the opener is the, I, was, I came across you while searching for realtors in Miami. And then as the body, we're using a case study as you know the body and then we have a call to action okay so that's an example of using a case study in the body so again it's very tangible specific outcome specific person uh, case study example number two this is going to be if you add it after the body so again you know when we were covering the cold email anatomy I said that you can optionally include a third line that's a case study. Um, and so a lot of the times we'll do this if, if there's a case study available. Um, and so in, in this example, you essentially just insert the case study after the body and before the call to action, giving you a cold email with about four lines, okay? So, hey John, was searching for top solar companies in Kingman and came across Soul Life. Keep up the great work. We have a way to bring you 16 solar installs over the next 30 days or you don't pay. Recently, we helped Solar Optimum in Jacksonville add 100K worth of solar deals to their pipeline in the first 14 days of working with us. Are you interested in learning more? Okay, um, and so all we're doing is we're just inserting a case study after the body and you can kind of see how we describe case studies this is really just kind of how you want to do it um and so again the exact company name where they're located the exact result in the exact time frame okay um and then a very small key distinction is if the case study was say for example that the case study like you wouldn't want to say we recently helped Solar Optimum get eight installs in the first 30 days of working with us. That's where a case study can backfire, right? Because if the guarantee is we have a way to bring you 16 solar installs over the next 30 days, but then in the case study you say we help Solar Optimum in Jacksonville get seven installs in the first 30 days, now the prospect's just going to be confused. They're like, well, the guarantee says this, but the case study says something different. I'm just not going to respond. Um, and so you notice how I said added 100K worth of solar deal. And so I'm using a different metric so that it doesn't confuse the prospect. Now, if they got more than 16 solar installs in 30 days, then I could include that, right? Um, and so that's just a very small key distinction. Don't overthink that. But what I'm trying to get at is you don't want to kind of go back on your guarantee when you're describing the case study or it'll really backfire. So if you need to, you can mention a different metric that doesn't confuse the prospect, if that makes sense, okay? Uh, and then case study example number three is gonna be using it in your follow-up. Uh, and then by the way, if you were to use it in your PS section, you would literally just take this right here put PS and then put it below the case study. And so you're literally just putting PS and then explaining the case study, okay? Uh, and then case study example number three is using it in a follow-up. Uh, and so in this example, you essentially just use the case study in one of your follow-up emails. The email below is email number two in the sequence. So if I use a case study in a follow-up sequence, I typically like doing it in email number two. Um, and so for example, the reason I reached out a few days ago is because we've been helping agency owners book more sales calls by leveraging new AI tech. 
We recently helped a state advertising, a marketing agency that specializes in real estate, book 28 qualified sales calls in the first 30 days of working with us. Are you open to hearing some ideas? I had to help you do the same, okay? So this would essentially be the email that's sent two days later after the first one. Uh, and so we're really just using the case study in one of our follow-ups. And I, this works really well, by the way, as a follow-up. So again, reason I reached out a few days ago, so making the follow-up relevant to the first cold email is because we've been helping agency owners book more sales calls by leveraging new AI tech. So again, giving them more context in case they forgot our first cold email, uh, giving them the case study. Uh, so you know, the company name, estate advertising, a marketing agency that specializes in real estate, book 28 qualified sales calls in the first 30 days of working with us. And then we're including a call to action in our follow up, which I'm a big fan of doing occasionally. Uh, are you open to hearing some ideas? I had to help you do the same. Okay. Uh, and so that's just really where the case case studies can fit in with cold email. So moving on putting it all together. Okay. Um, and so at this point, you should know how to write the opener, the body, the CTA, add a signature, and then how to insert case studies if you have them. Now I'll show you how to put all these pieces of the puzzle together and make sure that they flow. Okay. And so again, the biggest thing is making sure the entire cold email is relevant from start to finish. Uh, so from the opener to the call to action, again, in the same way, if you include a case study, you can make that relevant to the call to action by saying, are you open to, to hearing some ideas? We had to help you do the same, right? Um, and so read the entire cold email out loud and make sure it not only flows, but maintains relevance. Um, and so here's some real life winning cold email examples. So for example, Hey, first name. Uh, and then here's the, you know, here's the, the opener as a real estate agent. I imagine you're always looking for ways to get more listing opportunities body. We have a way to bring you seven listing appointments over the next few months. And if it doesn't work, you don't pay one of our clients, John Doe. So I obviously made his name anonymous to protect the identity of the real case study. One of our clients, John Doe, a residential agent in Miami added an extra 237 K worth of GCI in his first year working with us. Mind if I send more info, kind regards, and then the signature would go there. Okay. This cold email right here is booking like 40 calls a month. Okay. So these are real life examples of putting everything that you've learned so far together. Okay. Uh, example number two, home improvement niche. Hey, first name, I came across and so here's the, the here's the opener. I came across company name while searching for top rated contractors in city dash. I take it you're always looking for ways to get more contracts body. We have a way to bring you two bathroom remodels over the next 30 days or you don't pay mind if I send more info kind regards signature uh, example number three home improvement niche except in this case the ICP is different and we're reaching out to the marketing department of home improvement companies that are a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, and so again, the cold email needs to be relevant to the specific ICP that you're targeting. Okay. Uh, and so, Hey John, I notice you play a major role in company names, marketing efforts. I imagine you're always looking for ways to maximize the budget. We have a way to bring you 52 in-home appointments with homeowners actively looking to remodel over the next 20 weeks. Any interest in connecting on a quick five minute call to learn more? Uh, and it looks like this line right here should not be there. Um, again, I can't go back on my keyboard. Uh, and so again, this call to action is it's very low risk. So any interest in connecting on a quick five minute call, and then we use that five minute call to then push them to the actual main call, right? But because the five minute call is less, less friction, it's going to have a way higher take put and a way higher throughput. And then on that call, you can typically set a lot of them for the main appointment. Okay. Um, and so that's really the thought process behind this call to action. This one absolutely printed it booked meetings with company. It booked meetings with home improvement companies, 20 million, 4 million, 6 million, 7 million annual revenue. Okay. Um, and so this right here, absolutely amazing cold email, real life example. Uh, here's another example in the solar niche that absolutely ripped. Um, and so, Hey, John came across company name while searching for solar companies in city. We have a way to bring you 16 solar installations over the next 30 days or you don't pay mind if I send more info kind regards signature again. So this is the opener what we talked about same with the body call to action soft CTA very simple kind regards signature uh, and then example number five. This is if you're in the agency owner niche. Hey, first name as a fellow agency owner, I imagine you're always looking for ways to fill your sales team's calendar. 
if we could generate you 17 very specific qualified appointments in the next 30 days on a performance basis like we just did for state advertising would you be open to learning more okay so this cold email is actually a little bit different than what we covered the call to action is actually combined with the body and then the body also kind of mentions a case study so this is something we've experimented with that worked very well um and so it's really just a combination of the body and a case study and a call to action all in one okay um and it actually kind of makes the cold email shorter easier to fit on the mobile screen very relevant uh, and so this absolutely ripped okay um, and so i would recommend using that uh, and then the next one is going to be experimentation and so the simple cold email framework i just taught you works it's easy to follow and it will get meetings coming in the door however don't be afraid to also branch out and try your own things after you get the ball rolling so again like you could forever use the framework i just taught you of an opener of the body of the call to action signature and case studies but i would also recommend after you kind of use that and get good results is start kind of experimenting with your own things that no one else really knows about and oftentimes you can get this to work and so this might just be random strategies like sending one sentence cold emails um, um, and so really what you want to know though is like the key basic rules for writing a good cold email and so what this is going to look like is as long as your cold emails have a no-brainer offer they're short concise relevant straight to the point uh, you can test different ways of writing them okay I um, mean you don't have to use the framework I just showed you although I would recommend it especially at first and it hundred thousand percent works um, but as long as you kind of follow those rules you can test different kind of ways of organizing and writing them uh, kind of like we did with example number five okay um, and so also try to keep every email below 280 characters or 50 words and remember the majority of readers are on mobile okay so you want to keep it under 280 characters that's why we kind of try to do everything very short concise and relevant um, and then remember never talk about yourself more than you talk about the prospect so be actively cognitive of trying to keep a two to one ratio um, and so what this looks like is you should be speaking about the prospect twice as much as you speak about yourself okay and so for every time that you talk about yourself you should be talking about the prospect twice as much okay if that makes sense um and so you should be speaking about the prospect twice as much as you speak about yourself so a two to one ratio okay um and so as long as you follow all of those basic rules i would strongly recommend experimenting and trying new angles and ways ways of writing your cold emails for example the following one sentence email added six figures of MRR for one of our clients, right? So the way of writing this cold email is different than what I just showed you, but it, it built a 13K per month agency, okay? Um, and so it was literally just this one sentence email, apologies if this is too upfront, but we have a way to bring you more work for your home improvement company. Mind if I send more info? Kind regards, signature, okay? So again, it's different from the framework above, but it follows some of those basic rules of being short, concise, under 280 characters, et cetera, okay? Um, and so yes, the framework I just showed you, like I would start with this, but also don't be afraid to branch out and try new things. For example, like the one sentence cold email that I just showed you, okay? Um, and then the you know next point is sales assets. So if you're an extremely saturated niche, you can also try just offering sales a sales asset or video in your cold email using a value-based CTA, okay? Uh, and most of the people I know in the e-commerce niche, they just offer some type of sales asset in order to make the cold email work in such a saturated niche like e-commerce. Um, and so then once the prospect responds, and again, you're gonna have a higher throughput since you're just offering something of value using a value-based CTA. Um, and then when the prospect responds, you just send them the sales asset and include a CTA in the response when you send it to them, okay? Um, and you can also include an option to book a call inside of the actual sales asset. Uh, and this allows you to stand out in the prospect's inbox, get a higher throughput of positive responses and provide value up front. And so this is something to keep in mind that you can experience with. But if you're in a really saturated niche like e-com, this might be the best route to booking meetings, okay? Uh, especially in 2024. Um, and so a sales asset can essentially just be a case study in a document, an SOP in a document, or any type of process in, process in your business. Like this right here, if I was selling B2B lead gen, like a cold email service, which again, our main service is paid ads, but if I was selling a cold email related service, this document right here, like that this video is being filmed on, this is technically a sales asset 
asset and I could offer to send this to agency owners in a cold email campaign. And a lot of them are gonna say yes to it. Then when I send it to them, maybe at the bottom of the document, I include an option to book a call, maybe even at the top. Uh, but when I, in the email that I actually send it to them, when I respond, I'll also say, by the way, if you want us to implement these systems for you, you know, uh, you know, we can hop on a quick five, 10 minute chat, right? Or something like that, right? Um, and so, so again, and it, and, and it would either be documented inside of a Google Doc or Gamma, okay? So Gamma, like Gamma is also just like another way to present something. It's very similar to Google Docs, except it looks a lot cooler, to be honest with you. Uh, and so you can even build sales assets in Gamma. Uh, it's really just anything that will be of extreme value to your ICP. Uh, it can also be a free training or a case study breakdown video hosted on a landing page with a book a call button, okay? Uh, and so here's real life examples of using a sales asset in your email. So for example, you know, hey, first name, we just helped ABC Marketing book 17 qualified sales calls in the first 30 days of working with us. And I documented the entire process we use from A to Z. Mind if I send it over so you can use the same process at company name, right? And then if we're in a saturated niche, this is gonna get a ton of responses because we're leading with value. Uh, and then we would send them the sales asset uh, and the sales asset would have an option to book a call, but then if they reply positive, now we can follow up with them again with more hard call to actions trying to get them to book a call, okay? Um, and so this is, a, this is a strategy you can just use in general that works really well. Or if you're in a saturated niche, you might have to use this strategy, okay? Uh, another example is this, uh, hey, first name, just came across company names ad on Facebook, Dash, wanted to reach out. Recently, we partnered with Gymshark to 2X their email marketing revenue in 37 days by adding our plug and play flows. Mind if I send over the flows so you can do the same at company name, right? So that's even offering a sales asset like email marketing flows in a Google Doc uh, to e-commerce brands. If we saw an email marketing service, that's a great way to get the foot in the door uh, and get them exposed to a harder CTA and stand out in the inbox, okay? Uh, another example, if you're selling B2B lead gen, you can offer to give them a lead list, right? Um, and so I know I think Nick Abraham does this and they book a ton of calls doing this. Uh, and so they'll literally send this email to their ICP, you know, hey John, I just put together a list of 2000 leads that could be your ideal client. Mind if I send it over? And then obviously if they say yes, then you can very quickly build a list for very cheap uh, and then send it to them. And then again, in that, you know, uh, in the literally, you know, then you could, when you send it to them, have a CTA below to try to book a call, right? And so this is basically kind of the sales asset approach. Again, you can test this in any niche, but if you're in a saturated niche, I strongly recommend experimenting with this, okay? Uh, and again, I can make a whole nother video going into that. This is just supposed to be the definitive 2024 cold email guide. Uh, and so I had to touch on it at least a little, okay? Um, and so next is follow-up sequences. And so after writing your initial cold email, the next step is to write your follow-up sequence. Uh, and the beautiful thing about cold email automation is that we can also automate a follow-up sequence of additional emails for when the prospect doesn't respond to the initial cold email. Um, and so, you know, the best follow-up sequences are gonna flow together and remain relevant to the first cold email for the most part, okay? Uh, and like, I'm touching a lot on follow-up sequence because I, I see so many people go wrong with follow-up. Like they're still sending, hey, I'm just bumping this up. Uh, and like, again, it's just not that relevant to the first cold email. It just doesn't flow well together. It just doesn't work as well as it used to. Uh, and so we're really gonna touch on this. And so I typically send a total of five emails until they respond. Uh, and so what that looks like is the initial cold email, which you just learned how to write, plus four additional follow-ups that are all automated, okay? This allows you to get the most squeeze out of the lemon. If you notice like your deliverability dropping, maybe you cut out some of those emails and go on a little bit less, you know, emails sent. Uh, Cause if you send too many emails and a lot of people start reporting you as spam, it will harm your deliverability. Uh, but from what I've seen, like five emails, you know, typically is, it, you can get away with it and it does maximize the amount of meetings you book at least from what I've tested in, in certain niches, might be different elsewhere or at scale. Um, but I typically do like to send five emails to every lead, okay? Uh, and then another point is always split test your follow-ups the same way you would split test cold emails, okay? So I see a lot of people, they'll they'll try ABC for their cold emails, but they just use the same follow-up sequences, okay? But you'll see like if you split test at least two to three follow-up sequences for every step, you'll notice some of them perform significantly better. And then this allows you to build a really powerful sequence where even the follow-ups have been tested, maximizing that reply rate, okay? Um, and so 
always split test your follow-ups the same way you would split test multiple cold emails. Uh, and then again, if you have a case study and haven't used it in your cold email yet, a great place to put it is in your follow-ups. Uh, and then another thing is it's okay to use call to actions in some of your follow-ups. Like I do this all the time and I'll get a ton of people who book a meeting like or agree to a meeting directly from a follow-up CTA. Okay. So I see a lot of people when they write their follow-ups, they're just bumping this up. Uh, I'll assume you're not interested, but there's no call to actions in the follow-ups. Uh, and I found that, you know, we typically start booking more meetings when we include a call to action in some of our follow-ups. Okay. Uh, and then if you do have sales assets and you haven't offered them yet, you can offer to send them in your later follow-ups. Okay. Uh, and this may catch the attention of new prospects who have been ignoring your sequence up until that point. Okay. And so what I mean by this is if you sent cold email, number one, cold email, uh, email, number two, cold e email, number three, and you still haven't gotten a positive response, you in cold email number four, you can say, Hey, I just recorded a video breaking down X, Y, Z. Mind if I send it over that might catch the attention of someone who then ignored the first three cold emails. Cause maybe they don't want to, you know, maybe they don't want to engage with the offer in a sales way, but they're open to getting free value. Right. Um, and so you can, I, I typically like offering in the later follow up some sort of value to catch the attention of people who otherwise hadn't seen, hadn't responded yet. And again, this maximizes response rates, which should be the, a big goal of every cold email campaign next to booking meetings so you can have a healthy deliverability because the email service providers see that you're getting a healthy amount of responses okay uh, and then the final one and this goes against some popular advice never send a breakup email that willingly cuts off communication with the prospect okay so instead of saying at this point i'll assume you're maxed out on clients feel free to reach out if that changes that's you willingly telling the prospect hey you don't don't talk to me anymore right so typically instead of doing that i'll do what's called a, and, and like so i'll replace breakup emails with with what i call pass off emails so this is instead asking them if there's anyone else at the company you should reach out to um, and this typically works better because you know it, it, it still is kind of like an end all be all follow up, but you're not willingly like telling the prospect, you're not willingly cutting off communication. Instead, you're like, hey, is there anyone else at company name who I should speak to about X, Y, Z? And then either one, it's going to stroke the, the person's ego because it's them and it gets them to respond, or they just give you a different email of someone else at the company who would be a better contact. And then you can email them, but either way you get a response. Okay. Um, and so typically I like using pass off emails in substitution to break up emails. You'll see an example. Uh, and then my secret weapon has been having a fifth follow-up email. So just like a fifth email in the sequence that's sent at least 17 days after the fourth email. And we frame it as a new email by adding a new subject line. Um, and this has been huge. Like we book a ton of calls on the fifth email that we otherwise wouldn't have booked. Um, and a big part of this is because like a big part of cold email is just timing. Um, and so if they ignore the first four emails, it's easier to wait two weeks before sending the fifth and final email. Okay. And so I've included a link to another document of follow up examples. And so you can see email one. Uh, and so you can see how the follow ups flow, you know, with the emails. Again, this video is already running really long. Um, and so I'll leave it up to you to get the document and look through the follow up examples. And I gave two examples for every follow up. So like, for example, email 2A, that would be follow up number one, one, and then email 2B would be follow up number one, two. Okay, so you can see two examples of each, like one has a case study, one doesn't. Um, and so, you know, you can see examples of how to go about follow ups there. Again, if you want the document in this video, that will be available in the description. Okay, and you can literally use that. That as a as a hand guide like a book <laughs> because it's 36 pages for cold email in 2024 okay um and so if you want to check that out that'll be in the description uh so moving on after the follow-up sequences we need to talk about spin spin tax this is a crucial part of writing cold emails um and so maybe you've heard of spin tax maybe you already use it maybe you ignored it uh but spin tax is not optional you actually need it so need in all caps uh your deliverability will tank and i mean tank after a couple of months of sending cold emails, if you don't start using spin tax, okay? Uh, so when you start sending hundreds of cold emails of the exact same emails every day, the ESPs quickly catch on and start sending your emails to spam, okay? Uh, and spin tax allows you to randomize words and sentences in your cold emails and stay under the radar while sending hundreds of cold emails every day, okay? Uh, and you can also leverage ChatGPT to easily add spin tax to your emails. Um, and so, 
You can also leverage something similar known as liquid syntax to randomize text in your emails based on certain times and days of the week. This makes your emails appear more personalized and has the same benefits as regular spin tax, making each of your emails different. Okay. Uh, in order to implement liquid spin tax or sorry, liquid syntax, check your sending software's resource for a guide on how to do it based on the platform. So if you're using instantly look up how to use liquid syntax on instantly, or if you're using smart lead, look up how to use liquid syntax on smart lead. Okay. Uh, and then an easy way to make sure that every email is unique is to add spin tax with three to five inspirational quotes under your signature. Okay. Uh, and I'll show you an example of this in a little, but this will create so many random variations of your cold emails without looking out of place. Since a lot of people add quotes by their email signatures. Okay. So the sig the syntax formula for instantly is going to be bracket bracket random all caps dash and then you put variation number one variation number two and variation number three and you can put unlimited variations okay and so example for the beginning of our email we might put hey hi hello and then every email that sends it's either it's going to cycle between it's going to spin between hey using hey hi or hello and again this makes every email that's sent completely different um, and so again, this is the format that instantly uses smart leads may be slightly different. So check your sending software's format. Here's an example of using syntax in a cold email. Um, and so I'll actually copy this and like, we'll go to instantly. And like, if I paste this, you know, if I paste this here, uh, this is, so again, my, my keyboard's dead, so I can't delete this. Um, but for example, if I hit preview, you'll notice this is how the email reads, right? Um, and so by the way, if you ever see, this is a good point. If you hit preview, always click preview on your emails. See how I copied this email from a Google doc and it's showing these white lines. If that happens, that, that happens whenever you copy it from a Google doc, it won't show it here. But if I were to send this email, it would actually include it there. Okay. Um, and so what you do is you go to co code view and wherever it says, you know, wherever it shows this line of code right here, you want to cut that, you want to cut that out on each line. And then that will get rid of the, that will basically get rid of the, the white line. So where it shows the color code, you just go, you know, cut. Uh, and each time, you know, each place that it does that, you do that. This is very important. I've seen so many people they are like, my deliverability is terrible. I have no reason why. And it's because they wrote their cold email in a Google doc. Uh, and then when they went to, you know, when they went to copy it, uh, it basically included those lines. So see how I removed some of them. That's basically what you want to do. Um, and I'm going to pause the recording. I'll be right back. I'm going to plug in my keyboard so I can show a better example of this. Okay, we're back. So yeah, if you ever, if you ever write your cold emails in a Google doc and you bring them over to instantly that will happen and you have to open up the code view and remove all of those lines and then always press preview to make sure that it looks clean. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is absolutely, you know, huge. I've seen that mistake happen so much and it's, you know, it's terrible. Okay. Um, and so what you'll see right here is we've added spin tax, uh, spin tax to multiple sections of the email. Right. And so we're saying, Hey, and hi, uh, instead of saying, you know, came across company name, we're having it switch between came and stumbled. Right. So came across company name, stumbled across company name, both of those work. And then well looking for, it's going to switch between looking for and searching for. Uh, and so again, it's changing every cold email. The next one, it says, we have a way to bring you 16 solar and it's going to switch between installations and installs over the next 30 days or you don't pay. And then instead of saying, mind if I send more info, it's going to switch between mind if I share more info and mind if I send more info. Right. And then instead of just saying kind regards, every uh, email, it's going to spin between kind regards, best speak soon. We could even include more. This is obviously just for an example for this video. Uh, then we have our signature. Then below that, we're going to insert five different quotes. So I would just go to chat GBT and I would search up, uh, add five different quotes and include the person who wrote it. And then like you would just add each and like search up one sentence, sentence quotes, and you would just insert the quote here. So for example, uh, send more cold emails, make more money. And this is a quote by myself, uh, Jackson Williams. And then you would just include it like that in there. And then you would come up with five different quotes uh, and you would, and you would, and, and so obviously you would ask ChatGPT like you would want to include a real life quote if you, if you don't 
catch on to that. Uh, and then so you would add five different quotes. And then when we click preview, it shows us what one example of the cold email might look like, right? So, hey, stumbled across, uh, stumbled across company name while searching for solar companies in. And then these are blank because there's no leads uploaded to this campaign. Uh, but you'll see it's the stuff that's the text. It's spinning, right? So let's see if we can get my quote to show up. Um, quote, insert quote two, insert quote five, quote two, quote three. Um, quote five. And so you can see here, there's this bracket is messed up. So we have to put that. Uh, but okay, look, so now it added this quote, right? So send more cold emails, make more money, Jackson Williams, and then your signature will be right there. And then what happens is there's so many random variations of your cold email that it doesn't look like you're just blasting out the same cold email over and over again. Okay. So I uploaded this cold email, this spin tax example to chat GBT, and I asked it how many variations of that cold email there are with all of those spin tax. And by including all of that spin tax, there's exactly 14,440 variations this email can send us. Okay. So again, this is huge because it, it, as soon as the email service providers see that you're sending the same email over and over and over again, they start sending some of your emails to spam. But if you use spin tax, you add the quotes, that's huge. Uh, you use spin tax as much as you possibly can, maybe a little bit of liquid syntax. There's gonna be so many different variations your cold email can send as, because it's gonna randomly spin between these different words. That's why it's called spin tax, adding them in each email. That again, it's gonna look like every email that's being sent is unique, which helps you stay under the radar by sending thousands of cold emails a day in a long period of time, okay? Uh, and so spin tax, this is not optional. You need to take the time to do this. Uh, it's gonna get you way better deliverability over a longer period of time, okay? So it's not optional. You need to do it if you wanna see results of cold email, okay? Uh, and so that's really everything for part three in terms of writing the cold emails. Uh, and so now we'll go ahead and move on to part four, which is inbox management, okay? Uh, and so at this point, you have the inboxes, you have the leads, your cold email sequences are ready to go. Now it's time to start sending cold emails. However, just because you send a good cold email doesn't mean prospects will be begging to get on a call with you, okay? Uh, and so a lot of people don't realize this, but the truth is most replies won't be that straightforward. They'll be asking about pricing. They'll be asking for more info. They'll be asking specific questions. Yes, some people still will say like, let's chat, but the majority of positive responses are gonna be, they're not gonna just be begging to get on a call with you. They're gonna be asking for more info about something specific. They're gonna be asking like three different questions. They're gonna be asking about pricing. And because of this, you still need to have the right inbox management frameworks to turn responses into book calls, okay? Uh, and so inbox management is essentially just the art of turning cold email replies into book meetings. And it might sound straightforward, but there's a lot that goes into it. And this is where a lot of people go wrong is they do everything else right and they get replies, but they fail to convert a lot of those replies into book calls, okay? Um, and so the easiest ways to get the most calls out of your cold email campaign is by mastering and optimizing your inbox management process, okay? And the main goal of inbox management is to get a yes or a no answer from the prospect. If you get a yes, you'll wanna coordinate a time to meet with the prospect. If you get a no, you'll wanna remove them from your inbox and add them to your global block list. More on this later, okay? So more on this later. So we'll talk about the, the global block list later. Don't worry about that now. Uh, and so before breaking down the exact responses you can use, it's important to understand basic inbox management principles, okay? So one, only use smart lead, only use instantly and smart leads master inbox for handling your email replies, okay? So only use smart lead, only use inbox for handling the replies. Second, speed the lead is key. Uh, ideally, every lead should be responded to within 15 minutes. Uh, will it be possible 100% of the time with every response? No, but it's a standard that you need to set and you should strive for. The faster you respond to a cold email reply, the more likely they are to turn into a book call, okay? Uh, and waiting more than 24 hours to respond to a lead and the chances of them booking is extremely low, okay? So if you're waiting more than 24 hours to get back to a lead, chances of you booking them is gonna be very low, okay? So speed to lead is absolutely key because again, they're a complete stranger. They're showing interest in your offer. You need to respond to them in the moment that they, closest to the moment that they showed that interest, okay? Uh, or if you wait more than a day, which a lot of people do, like you're just not gonna be booking that many calls. Ideally, if you could respond to every lead in 15 minutes, your your booking rate will double easily, okay? Um, and so speed to lead is key. Second, 
always manually send a personalized response to each prospect's response. Yes, you can use AI inbox managers and automated responses, but you'll lose out on a ton of meetings, okay? So say for example, we send a cold email, the prospect says, uh, please send me more information. Yes, we could send some automated response through AI, but to get the highest amount of meetings booked, we wanna send a personalized response to them, okay? Um, and you can automate the follow-ups if your initial response doesn't get them on a call, but the initial response should always be personalized and sent manually by you or another human on your team, okay? Uh, and then always make it as easy as possible for the prospect to agree to a meeting, okay? So what this means is you should manually give them two days slash times for a call and include a link to your Calendly to make it easy as possible. So don't just send a link to your Calendly because again, that takes friction. So you all, you wanna offer two manual times, like how does tomorrow at 3 p.m. or Tuesday at 2 p.m. PST work? Alternatively, if it's easier, feel free to book a call with me here, right? Because if we propose two times manually, but it turns out that the prospect doesn't have those two times available, now they're gonna have to send us another email to say those times don't work, and that's just another step of friction. It's another back and forth where we can where we can lose them. So we also want to include a link to to the Calendly on top of proposing two times again to make it as easy as possible for them to book the meeting. Okay, but we don't want to just send the Calendly, and we don't want to just propose two manual times. We want to do both, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and and then also go as far as including the prospect's exact time zone when you mention your availability so they don't have to do any mental math. So don't tell, if you're in PST, don't say, let's chat tomorrow at 3 p.m. PST or Monday at 3 p.m. PST. And then if the prospect's on uh, EST or some other time zone, now they manually have to do math. And again, we wanna make it as frictionless as possible. So when you're proposing your meeting times, always look at the prospect's state and then just do the math in your head and use their time zone. Again, it's all about making it as easy as possible for the prospect to agree to a meeting, okay? Uh, and then never, and I repeat never, share pricing information when the prospect asks within their reply. Instead, push the prospect for a call so you can give them an accurate price based on their needs, right? And so that's kind of the language pattern you use to then get them on the call without giving the price over email. Um, and if the prospect learns the price before getting on a call, and understanding the true value of your service, they'll almost never get on the call, okay? So it's very rare that you give the price and then the prospect will get on the call. If the prospect is extremely persistent about pricing over email, then you can give them a range, okay? So the first time they ask the price, do not give it to them. Try to push them to a call under the context of to give them an accurate price based on their needs. If they keep persisting, they're like, look, I don't wanna get on a call until I know the price, you can you can give them a range and then still again, push for the call, okay? But the first time they ask you the price and I see a ton of people lose meetings on this is they'll just give them the price. Do not do that, okay? Push them for the meeting and I'll show you how, okay? Uh, avoid using salesy messaging or words, okay? So instead, try to sound very casual like you're emailing a friend and make sure your replies flow and remain relevant to the previous emails, okay? Um, and so if they're not relevant to the previous emails, it's gonna look like you're using some type of automated response and don't use any salesy words that will trigger resistance, okay? So literally just the way you respond to them should just be like very casual. Like again, you're just emailing a friend, okay? Or you're emailing someone within your internal organization. Uh, and then if you, if you start having a conversation with the prospect over email, every single one of your replies should be pushing for a call to get it off email. Avoid having back and forth conversations over email. So if the prospect asks a question, don't just answer it, answer it, but then propose a call and why they should get on that call to learn more about the question that they had. And then if they ask another question, instead of just answering their question and going back and forth, every single response that you send to them should be pushing for a call, okay? Because again, that's the main goal is getting a yes or no answer. If it's a yes, we give them a proposed time. If it's a no, we remove them from the inbox and add them to the block list. So we don't wanna just go back and forth over email. Again, we wanna try to push them to the call as quickly as possible. Um, and so don't just have this conversation back and forth Every single one of your responses should have a CTA to book a call and why it's beneficial for them to book the call. So if they ask you, oh, what would the ads look like for me? 
when you answer them, you want to say, honestly, it really depends depending on the client and, you know, and their business. That being said, what would probably be more appropriate is hopping on a quick call so we can discuss this, right? And then if like, oh yeah, but you know, will the ads be run on Facebook or Instagram? Then you'll say, you know, again, it really depends what's going to be best is getting on a call. I really can't explain this over email, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so you just want to, and that was a terrible example, but what I'm trying to get at is every single reply that you give should be pushing for a call to avoid going back and forth and back and forth over email forever until the call just never gets booked and the prospect dries out. Okay. Uh, and then never, never use words like just following up or bumping this up when you're following up with interested leads. These are just very overused and salesy words. So just avoid them. Uh, and then try your hardest to avoid making it look like your follow up messages are just copy and paste. So when you're following up with positive leads, again, ask yourself, does this follow up look like it was copy and pasted? If so, edit it. Okay. Uh, and then if they don't respond to the first handful of follow ups, keep going, but space out the time intervals further. Okay. So follow up is the key to inbox management, you know, like plan on, you know, plan on most prospects, not replying to your first message. Um, and you know, after a lead gives you a positive reply, you should follow up with them until you get a yes or a no, even if that means following up with them up to 10 times. Okay. Uh, so even if a lead, you know, if they agree to a meeting and then you propose times and they don't get back to you, follow up with that lead up to 10 times. It's very probable that you can book them on the fourth or fifth follow up or even more. Okay. Um, and so, but if you still don't get a response after your first, you know, three to five follow ups, keep following up, but space out the intervals to once a week, once every two weeks, etc. Okay. Um, and so another thing too, is adding personalized looms in your follow up sequences is an easy way to re-engage the prospect, okay? And then utilize all channels to your follow-up with positive replies. So use LinkedIn, right? If someone agreed to a call, if they asked about pricing, if they asked for more info, but they never booked a call after you've, you've responded to them, find them on LinkedIn, send them a message there, find their number, give them a cold call, find them on Instagram, Facebook, send them a message, okay? Uh, and so, positive replies are like the lowest hanging fruit in your cold email system. Like if someone replied positively to your cold email, again, not everyone is going to book a call when you then propose a time, but you want to be following up with them. Uh, and it's easy. It can be an easy way to get their attention is by following up with them on different platforms. And that creates urgency. They're like, okay, this person, they messaged me on email. I didn't get back to them. Now they're messaging me on LinkedIn and they're calling me what they have must be important. I'm going to give them a chance. Okay. Um, and so use omni channel follow up. Uh, and then right here is our inbox management SOP. Uh, and so what this has is if they agree to a meeting, you know, here's, uh, here's multiple ways to, to handle that response. Right. Um, and so again, I'm not going to break down this entire document for the sake of time, but this literally has, you know, the majority of responses you can get, this has a way to respond, right? So these examples are general and used to give you a good idea on how to respond based on specific scenarios. Do not copy and paste them. Remember to apply all the basic fundamentals that we just covered. And the main goal of these responses is to set them on a meeting, right? So if the prospect agrees to a meeting and that's their response, you can use either of these two examples to to book in that meeting, right? If the prospect asks about pricing, you can use one of these five examples to then uh, defer the pricing question and get them on a call, okay? Uh, if they ask for more information, so like if you had a hard CTA and they said, send me more information, here's how you can respond, right? If your call to action is mind if I send more info, here's how you can respond, okay? Um, and so again, this is an inbox management SOP. Use this, don't copy it exactly, but use it as an example on how to handle different responses, okay? Uh, and then what I recommend doing is creating Slack alerts. So whenever a new lead responds to your cold email, you can even use OpenAI and Zapier so that as soon as a new cold email response comes in and instantly, that response is automatically sent to ChatGBT and then ChatGBT will tell if it's positive or negative and then include that in the Slack alert, okay? But the biggest thing is that you wanna have some type of internal alert system. You know, Slack is typically what most people are using. Uh, and Slack, you know, you wanna have alerts of everything that's happening in your business. Cold email replies, new leads from ads, new meetings booked, where they came from, new contracts signed, new onboarding form completed. You should have Slack alerts set up for all of these things so that you have a good thumb on the pulse of your business. But also you have this centralized hub where all these different events are organized in channels and recorded. But 
you know, with, uh, and this, this will be very useful if you hire an inbox manager, they can get an alert when a new reply comes in and then they know to then open up instantly and reply. Cause again, speed to lead is going to be one of the biggest outliers that determines your cold email inbox management success. Okay. Um, and so I recommend setting up Slack alerts for as soon as a positive reply comes in. And then as soon as you see that Slack alert, open up instantly, open up smart lead, respond to the prospect, okay? Uh, and then immediately after responding, add them to a corresponding subsequence that's delayed by two days. And this is how you automate following up with positive leads, okay? So more on this below. So af as mentioned previously, after a prospect has replied positively, we wanna follow up with them until they book a call or tell us to F off, okay? Even if we need to send them more than 10 follow-ups, literally, okay? Uh, and these follow-ups will be activated using the subsequences feature. Uh, and so create a subsequence and use the example below to add a 48 hour delay until the first cold email sequence has started. Um, and so what I mean by this is if we go to the inbox right here uh, and you can see right here, you know, this, this person replied to the cold email after, you know, we respond, he responded to him, he marked him as interested. And then what this does is it moves him onto a subsequence that's delayed by two days. And so it says, wait two days, and then it's going to send him a follow-up. Hey, what are your thoughts on my previous email? Uh, it's going to wait another two days. Hey, happy Wednesday. Can we pencil you in for a quick intro call this week? Alternatively, if it's easier, feel free to grab a time with me here. And it goes all the way up to seven emails. Okay. Uh, and typically it goes up to 10. And so now what you do is as soon as you respond to a lead. Um, and so say, for example, that I respond to this lead right here, obviously this is a negative response. Um, but say, for example, that, you know, I respond to this lead. Uh, after I send that response, I would then mark them as interested. This will automatically move them to the subsequence and it will follow up with them in two days if they don't respond to my response. Okay. And so you want to be using the, the subsequences feature. And then once they respond, you can just mark them as meeting booked if they replied positive or if they replied negative, not interested. And then that will remove them from the subsequence. Okay. So you want to use the subsequences feature to your advantage for positive lead follow up. But it's very important that you add a 48 hour delay to the subsequence because again, you're sending the first response manually, but then that gives two days for the lead to respond to our positive response handling response. And then it'll automatically start following up with them for us. This is how you really maximize meetings booked. Okay. Uh, and so you want to use the subsequences feature to follow up with interested leads. Um, and so using a subsequence of 10 plus follow-ups for interested leads will two to five X the amount of meetings that you book. Okay. Uh, and so click here again, like I'm just dropping too much sauce in this video. Like my team thinks I'm crazy for giving all of this away. Um, but I'm also giving an interested reply follow up sequence example. Uh, and so this is 10 emails that again, you can use to follow up with interested leads. Okay, so an interest a lead who replies positively, this means if they ask for more info, they agreed to a meeting or they asked about pricing. Those are all positive responses. Okay. Uh, and so right here, this is basically like an SOP for a, a, a subsequence for leads who reply positively. So again, they're automatically being followed up with up to 10 emails. Okay. Now, Again, do not copy this word for word. It's intended to be used as an example. Um, and so take it, customize it to your niche, change it up a little bit. Uh, but this is an example of a 10 email follow-up for if a lead replies positive, right? So if we send a, a cold email to a lead, they're like, hey, yeah, let's hop on a meeting. And then we respond to them and we propose a time. We then mark them as interested. If they don't get back to us confirming that time, it will immediately move them to this sequence, you know, Two days later, if they haven't responded to us with the time, well, uh, confirming the time, hey, John, what are your thoughts on my previous email, right? And then it'll keep following up with them until they respond and then book a call, okay? Uh, and so use that as a positive reply subsequence. This is gonna two to five extra meetings booked easily by following up with every positive reply up to 10 times, okay? This has been huge for the campaigns that we're overseeing, okay? Uh, and I also recommend creating a second subsequence for out of the office leads, so OOO. Uh, and this subsequence should be delayed by three to four weeks and use the prospect being out of the office as a personalization point. So for example, for every, you know, for every lead that's out of the office. Um, and so, you know, what that might look like, it looks like, uh, and so like that will look like this, like uh, when a lot of people go out of the office, it'll send a response like this, like, you know, I'll be out of the office starting Thursday, November 14th. This is an automated response that, that they set up. 
And so if you send people a cold email when they're out of the office, it's going to automatically send this response. And because the cold email is being responded to there, that lead is going to be removed from the sequence. And this can waste a ton of your leads. But if you mark them as out of the office, you can create an out of the office subsequence that's delayed by three to four weeks and it'll automatically add that lead to that sequence. And three to four weeks later, it will automatically follow up with them saying, Hey, John, try to reach out a few weeks ago. Notice you were out of the office. I hope you enjoyed your time off. The reason I was, I reached out is because, and then the body of the cold email and then the call to action. And then you can have follow-ups in the subsequence. Okay. Uh, and so this also allows you to keep sending emails during holiday periods when a lot of the competition turns off their campaigns. The reason a lot of the competition turns off their campaigns during the holidays is because, you know, statistically more people than ever turn on OOO. Um, and so if you're sending them emails and, and it's just responding with out of the office, you know, those leads are being burned. But if you set up the OOO subsequence now, you know, during the holidays, when less people are sending cold emails, you're still sending them. So the people who aren't out of the office are more likely to respond to you. And then the people who are out of the office, they're not being burned because they're just being moved to a different subsequence that's going to re-engage them. Uh, and so hopefully that makes sense. This works during all periods of the year. Like if someone goes off on maternity leave and they and they uh, put their thing on OOO, you know, there's a lot of e even during the summer when people just go on vacation, you don't want these leads being burned. Uh, and so you want to set this up so that three to four weeks, it automatically follows back up with them and re-engages them. So you're not just throwing away leads. OK, uh, and those are really the main ways that I use the the subsequence feature is for positive responses and then out of the office responses. You can also use it in other cases. Uh, that's typically just what I use it for. OK, uh, and so hopefully that makes sense. Really, the last part about, you know, inbox management is going to be what I call outbound dials. Uh, and so most people in the cold email space are absolutely sleeping on using outbound dials in their cold email systems. Um, and so what an outbound dial is, it's the act of calling leads who respond positively to your cold email and booking them in for a sales call over the phone. OK, uh, and so this has been a game changer for our clients who implemented it. Uh, and if you look at all of the big guys who build real outbound departments, they always have have SDRs who call all of the cold email positive responses. Okay. So what this looks like is if someone responds positively to your cold email, instead of just getting back to them over email, you just call them up and you try to push them straight to a call. And this books an insane amount of meetings. Um, and so if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend the book cold calling 2.0 by Aaron Ross, uh, or sorry, predictable revenue. The concept is cold calling 2.0. But Salesforce, they added over a hundred million dollars of revenue by adding by adding cold email with you know outbound dials. And so essentially they have they build this cold email system, and as soon as someone replies positively, they have an SDR then call them up and you know follow up with them over phone, voicemail, and text, trying to book them in for that call. Okay. Um, and so if the leads that you scraped come with phone numbers, you absolutely need to be doing this, especially if you're in a niche like home improvement, landscaping, etc. These guys hate going back and forth over cold email from the data that we've seen. Um, and so especially if you're in a niche like that, don't rely on just emailing them back for your inbox management pick up the phone and dial them. Okay. Uh, and so really the first step to outbound dials is to create a zap that looks like this. Okay. So new email response, uh, it's going to get sent to open AI. So chat GBT, uh, and you'll just create a prompt that and, and give chat GBT enough data to identify whether the response is positive. Then if the response is positive, you'll create a filter. Uh, and so if it is positive, then you'll get a Slack alert with the leads phone number. And then the next step is that the lead will automatically be added to the CRM. OK, uh, and then that way, every time you get a new cold email response, you or your SDR gets a Slack alert if the if the reply was positive, including the phone, num including the name, email and phone number of the lead. And then the lead is automatically added to the CRM where the, you or the SDR can dial them. OK, uh, and the key with outbound dials is speed to lead. OK, so you should try and call the lead within five to ten minutes of them replying to your cold email. Uh, and so here's an example of an outbound dial script. And so again, say say that someone replies positively to our cold email. Uh, instead of just sending them an email, we're actually going to grab their number and call them up right away. So we're going to say, hey, is this John? Yeah, it's Jackson here. I was actually just calling because, you know, I saw you responded to my email in regards to the 10 listing appointments that was sent from Lead Odyssey. 
Yeah, so I just figured I'd call you up personally. You know, I know email's crazy these days. It's easy to waste time going back and forth. And you know, I know that you actually just wanted a little bit of more info regarding the whole 10 listing appointment things. Has anyone else on our team reached out to you about this yet? Yeah, and you know, the reason you didn't get anything right away is just because our company helps agents in a ton of different ways. And you know, we really just wanted to make sure that the info you got was actually relevant to where you're at in your real estate business right now. You know, opposed to going back and forth over email for weeks, is that something I can just get for you right now? Cool. Yeah. So like, you know, what do you think your biggest challenge is at the moment? Like, you know, based on that, I can definitely pair you up with some internal resources that are going to be most helpful. Okay. Uh, and that might've sound a little scripted. I've been talking the past three hours. So my voice is, it was a little messed up. Uh, and then once they, once they agree, once they answer the question on their biggest challenge, you just transition to a triage call. And then the goal of the triage call is to one, sell them on booking the main call and then qualify them at the same time. Okay. So you can either do this yourself if you're in the earlier stages of your business, or you can just hire an SDR, which is like just an outbound appointment setter. Uh, and then here's the voicemail if they don't pick up. Um, and then always double dial this document kind of explains it. And if you want to get a script for a triage call, just go to Cole Gordon. He's got like the best triage call script in the game. Um, and so you do the outbound dial as soon as the lead answers the question about their biggest bottleneck or problem, then it immediately transitions into do a triage call where which is like a five to ten minute call where they're going to be set for the main call okay um and so doing this outbound dials is the easiest way to immediately double the amount of meetings that you book from cold email and then again this can you know be delegated to an sdr on a commission basis plus small base okay uh keep in mind that sdrs need to be compensated differently from your typical setters which are mdrs uh since outbound typically takes more grunt work right so like in the appointment setting world you have sdrs you have mdrs and so like an sdr is a sales development representative typically a, a, an appointment setter who does outbound and creates interest from complete cold strangers where an MDR works in conjunction with marketing assets. So if you're running a VSL funnel, an MDR would be calling up the opt-ins, pushing them to a triage call. Um, and so, you know, keep in mind, if you do hire an SDR to do this, you typically have to pay them a higher commission and potentially a base since this does take a little more grunt work than, than MDR work. Okay. Um, and then I could do an hour long training on how to do outbound dials as long as you just grow a pair of balls or hire someone who already has them, pick up the phone every time a lead replies positively, you're gonna book more meetings, okay? Regardless of the script you have, if you just start calling up every positive response, you're gonna start booking more meetings, okay? So if you have their phone numbers, trust me, start doing this. Um, and then, you know, outbound dials are, they're so effective because you know the lead is active since they just responded to your email. So pickup rate is gonna be really high. And then the conversion rates are really high because they've already expressed interest in your offer, okay? Um, and so trust me, if you have their phone numbers, you need to be doing this. I mean, if you're in a niche like home improvement or, or landscapers, like this is the only way you're really gonna maximize your cold email results. These guys, they just hate going, like responding to emails. So as soon as they reply positively, just still respond to them, but definitely just call them up, okay? Uh, and that's like where a lot of the benefit of the cold email system will come from in those niches is just identifying people to call. Um, but again, no matter what niche you're in, if you can get their phone number, do this. Okay. Uh, and so from the expert Apollo, you'll get their phone numbers uh, and you can use other platforms to enrich your list and get phone numbers. So like lead rocks is an amazing tool that gives you phone numbers where you can upload a lead list that you already have and it will fill in all the missing phone numbers. Okay. Um, and so obviously you just need to make sure that you have good phone number data, but don't sleep on outbound dials. Okay. Uh, and then part five of the video, this has been a long one. Uh, so again, if you appreciate this, I've been filming this all in one take, please subscribe, please drop a like, uh, this is obviously me walking through a 36 page document in one sitting. Uh, so if you do, if you are getting value out of this, you know, please subscribe, please drop a like, uh, obviously I'm putting in a lot of my time. I think I've already missed like one meeting that I had, uh, and, and because I just don't want to, you know, have to edit or cut out the video. Uh, and so we'll, keep going but we're on part five sustaining deliverability okay uh, and so deliverability tips okay so throughout the training we've already covered a few crucial deliverability practices like using godaddy plus outlook which felt like we talked about that a year ago uh, adding spf dkm and dmark only creating two to three users per domain only send 25 to 30 cold emails per user 
verifying all of your leads and formatting them and always using spin tax. However, there's a few more deliverability related concepts that you need to understand because it doesn't matter how good your leads and cold emails are if none of your emails are landing in the inbox. Okay. Uh, and so the first one is going to be open tracking. Um, and so I recommend turning open tracking off after you know that you have a decent open rate. Okay. Um, and so if you, you only want to have open tracking turned on in the beginning of your campaigns to make sure everything is working properly, um, because when you have open tracking turned on, it literally adds a picture that's invisible to every single one of your cold emails that you send and this harms your deliverability because there's a pixel attached to the email which increases the size of the code okay um, and so turning it off will immediately increase your deliverability so only use open tracking to make sure everything is working at first then turn it off to remove that pixel from going out in your cold emails okay uh, the next thing is going to be the one-to-one -one ratio and 60 cold email limit or 60 email limit sorry um, and so each of your inboxes should never be sending more than 60 total emails per day I see a lot of people get confused on this and they start sending 60 cold emails. This is including cold emails and warm up emails. Okay. You should also have a one to one ratio on cold emails to warm up emails. Um, and so if one of your inboxes is sending 30 cold emails per day, the same inbox should be sending 30 warm up emails per day. Okay. Um, and so there always needs to be a one to one ratio totaling to 60. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you're totaling to 60 or below, um, and obviously the less, the better, but like I I like doing 30 cold emails and 30 warm up emails to hit that total limit of 60 with the one to one ratio, right? Um, and then it, you know, if you want to scale your volume, don't increase sending volume above the total limit of 60 per day and don't mess with the one to one ratio. Instead, just buy more domains and create two to three inboxes per domain that are all sending within the total limit of 60 emails per day. Okay. So that's how you scale cold email. You don't increase the sending limit above the total of 60, or you don't mess with that one to one ratio. You just buy more domains and you buy more inboxes. Okay. So what a lot of people I know do is 25 cold emails, 25 warm up emails. So one to one ratio, it totals to 50, which is under 60. Okay. Or you could do 20, 20 for even better deliverability. I wouldn't personally, I like pushing it to the absolute limit, uh, 30 cold emails, 30 warm up. Okay. So you actually have to go into your warm up settings and configure the warm up limit to make sure that it matches the cold email, the inbox limit one to one. So that's very important. Okay. Um, and then ramp up. Okay. So when your inbox has completed the first 14 days of warm up, do not start sending the total 25 to 30 cold emails per day right away. Um, and so you need to go through something called the ramp up process until you hit that 25 to 30. So for example, day one, after the 14 days of just warm up, you're going to start it at five emails per day per inbox. Then four days later, you're going to bring it up to 10 emails per day. And then every five days, you're going to increase it by five until you eventually hit 30 cold emails per day. And then on the 25th day, when you increase it to 30 cold emails per day, you're going to set the daily warm up limit to 30 warm up emails per day. Okay. Um, and so you can stop at 25. Again, the sweet spot is 25 to 30. If you want a little bit to be on the safe end, you can do 25 cold emails. Uh, I started, you know, when I first got into the cold email and when I first started my cold email career, I did 25. Uh, and then we started lifting it up to 30. Didn't notice too much of a difference. So we've just been leaving it at 30 uh, to get an extra five cold emails per day per inbox, which, you know, if you have a lot of inboxes, it does add up. Um, and, it's, and it's safe as long as you have a one to one 30, you know, 30 cold emails and 30 warm up emails. Okay. Uh, so it's very important that you go through ramp up. So again, you're going to have 14 days of just uh, warm up when you first get the users. Then after those 14 days are complete, do not start sending the full 25 to 30 on day 15. Start out with five emails, five days later, increase it to 10, five days later, increase it to 15, so on and so forth until you hit 25 or 30. When you hit 25 or 30, then you want to increase the warm up limit to match the sending volume. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, next section is going to be red emulation. Um, and so I recommend going into advanced warm up settings and turning on red emulation inside of instantly or smart lead. Uh, and what red emulation does is it essentially has a positive impact on deliverability as it mimics human behavior in your warm up emails, right? And so your warm up emails that are being sent out, when you turn this on, you know, through the warm up function, now human behavior will be simulated in these warm up emails and it will communicate to the ESPs that someone is actually reading the warm up emails. And again, really don't worry about what it does too much. 
just know that it positively impacts your deliverability and that you should turn it on. Okay. Um, and if you want to read more about it, just search up red emulation instantly. And it explains a lot more in that article. Okay. But I highly recommend turning it on. And it signals to the ESPs that your messages are relevant as they're being read by the email receiver. Okay. Uh, and so it will help your deliverability. I recommend turning it on. Uh, next one is going to be to avoid spam words. And so there's specific keywords that if found in your cold emails will decrease your chances of landing in the inbox. Um, and these are called spam words, quote unquote spam words. Okay. Uh, and the ESPs are all, so ESPs, email service providers, are always looking for them. So try your best to avoid them. Okay. So get familiar with the 700 spam words here. Uh, and so instantly wrote an article on the 700 spam words, right? So uh, avoid uh, bankruptcy, cheap, you know, there's all these different words that you know, the email service providers pick up on. Now, you know, you'll likely notice that we didn't use the word guarantee in many of our cold emails. Uh, and that's why it's actually one of those spam words. So typically, or you don't pay is better than saying guarantee because you're avoiding a spam word. Okay. Uh, and don't overthink this. Like don't try to make your emails perfect with zero spam words, but try to get as close as possible to zero without ruining the content of the cold email, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's going to be hard to write like a good cold email without using any of them and kind of still being like persuasive about the offer. But you want to try to get as close as possible to using zero spam words without ruining the actual content of the cold email. Okay, uh, next next deliverability tip is going to be bounce rates. And so as we briefly touched on during lead scraping, sending emails to bad leads results in a bounce. Okay. So try to keep your bounce rate below two to 3% at all times. Uh, and this is done by making sure you verify every single lead list using million, ver ver million verifier. Do not cut corners. Do not use some cheaper verification software. You will likely have a higher bounce rate. And so you want to keep that bounce rate under two to three, ideally under two, uh, meaning that less if you send 100 emails for every 100 emails you send less than two to three should be bouncing. OK, um, and if you see a higher bounce rate than three percent, immediately stop the campaign, pause it and reclean the leads. OK, so this can sometimes happen. Maybe, you know, you or someone on your team forgot to verify them. Maybe somehow during the spreadsheets when you're formatting them, they accidentally got mixed up. Uh, and so always kind of keep a, a cognitive note to, to keep check on the bounce rate. If you see anything above the ordinary, it's very important that you immediately stop the campaign, re-verify the leads and stop any damage from being done. OK, uh, and then bad performing campaigns. OK, if it's been more than two weeks and a campaign has an extremely low response rate, like below two to five percent, it's best to cut it. OK, um, and so sending lots of emails with a low response rate communicates to the ESPs that your emails are likely spam. And so you do want to give it two weeks. Sometimes it takes the campaigns a little bit to get going. Some people don't check their email for a couple days. Some people only respond to the follow up. But if it's been two weeks and your reply rate is really low and again, depending on the niche, like below two to five percent. But for example, like in some niches, two percent might be good. So again, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but if it's like really low, it's best to cut it because if you're sending a lot of emails and not a lot of people are responding, it tells the email service providers that your emails are likely spam and then they're going to start sending them to the to spam and lower your deliverability. OK, uh, the next thing is going to be inbox rotation. Um, and so rotating your inboxes is an amazing strategy for increasing the life of your domains and inboxes. Um, and so it's not a question of if your inboxes will be burned. It's a question of when they will be burned. OK, so again, a lot of people don't realize this, like when you're buying domains or cold email, they're not going to last forever, right? You're doing an activity that slowly degrades them over time. The act of sending cold emails. It's not a question of if your inboxes will be burned. It's a question of when. Um, and so inbox rotation, you can use this to prolong their, their, their life. Um, and so, you know, inbox rotation is, is the process of having half of your inboxes sending cold emails while the other half remains on warm up and you swap them every 30 days. So for example, if you have 30 total inboxes, 
15 will be used in an active campaign at any given time, while the other 15 will be left on just warm up and not active in a campaign. Then you will rotate each set of 15 uh, between active cold email campaign and warm up every 30 days. Um, and this helps the inboxes reverse any damage done from the cold emailing during the 30 day period uh, while they get left on warm up and this prolongs the life, okay? Um, and so inbox rotation, obviously this means you have to buy more domains to get the, the desired sending volume, but it can increase the life of those domains. So it's just something to think about. Uh, Next thing is going to be, you know, global block list. Um, and so, you know, one second, let me fix this. Um, and so, you know, global block lists are essentially, uh, you know, so it's important that you configure your global block list. Okay. Uh, and what the global block list is, is, you know, it's essentially a list of leads that automatically get filtered out by, by every lead list that you upload. Um, and so, it's important that you can configure your global block list and make sure that every lead who replies negatively, so leads who say stop, unsubscribe, not interested, all of these leads need to be being uploaded to your global block list, which is this list that's that's connected to your, your sending software that every time you upload a list of leads to instantly or smart lead, it's automatically filtering out anyone who may be in your global block list, okay? Um, and so, and it's important to do this because anyone who replies negatively, you want them on your block list so that you don't ever send them a cold email again. Uh, because if you do, it's highly likely that they'll remember you of when they replied negative and they'll report you as a spammer, right? Um, and so when you start getting a lot of people reporting you as a spammer, it harms your deliverability, which is ultimately why the inboxes degrade over time is because it's just natural that when you're emailing complete strangers, some of them are going to mark you as spam, right? But we want to decrease that number as much as we possibly can within our control. And the way you do that is with the global block list. Um, and so you know, really the use case behind this is when you use various lead sources, it's very possible that you might accidentally scrape leads that you've already contacted. Um, or if you want to do what Hermosi recommends and reuse a lead list every three, three to four months, you want to make sure that anyone who replied negatively automatically gets removed when you re upload that list. Okay. So again, if you do upload them and you send them another email, it's very likely that they mark you as spam because they remember that they got another one of your emails and they told you to stop. Okay. Uh, and I also added a step in our onboarding zap inside of Zapier that automatically adds our clients emails once they fill out an onboarding form into our global block list. And that way, if we upload a lead list to instantly that has one of our clients, they'll automatically be removed because back when I was running a real estate agency, I accidentally cold emailed one of my clients. Uh, and so never again is that going to happen because you can add that as a step inside of Zapier. Okay. Um, and so I recommend just doing that. Uh, and again, global block list, you know, it's necessary to again, add every negative response to, to where it gets automatically filtered out. Okay. Final deliverability tip health checks. Okay. So I recommend checking your cold email inboxes health at least once a month. I prefer using inbox these free inbox placement tests. Uh, so this right here is pretty much the best place to get your inbox tested. I see a lot of people talking about Glock apps. It's personally, I've just seen it's not that accurate. Uh, and I really recommend using Inboxy plus it's free. Uh, and it's going to give you really good and accurate data on your inboxes deliverability and where it's currently at. Are there any blacklist or glaring red flags, etc. cetera. Uh, and you know, is going to give you a really accurate breakdown of your current deliverability. And really the goal is that you, you run this test that's free once a month and you see if there's any glaring red flags, right? So if there's any glaring red flags with your deliverability, you'll want to pause all campaigns and leave your inboxes on warm up for a week. Okay. So leave your, you leave your inboxes on warm up only, meaning that you just pause any active campaigns, but you leave them on warm up. Okay. Um, and then Softwares like instantly, they're going to have a built in health score. However, it's not 100% accurate. That's why I rec recommend using Inboxy. Um, but you can use this to kind of get a good thumb on the pulse of where the deliverability is at. And so, you know, if your instantly health score falls below 97%, then there's likely an issue somewhere like so if you like on instantly, you can see if the health scores are below 97%. If you see that, then there's likely an issue somewhere, like maybe a DNS record got messed up. Maybe there's a high percentage of bounces. Maybe there's not enough spin tax. Maybe the domains are just getting old. Um, and so, 
you know, kind of, kind of, you can kind of use the built-in health score to kind of get a good idea. And so if you're using instantly and you see that percentage attached to each domain drop below 97%, there's probably an issue. And then you, and then, you know, that can give you also a good idea that, Hey, I should leave these on warm up for a week. Also, if you buy your domain from the wrong place, like Inframail, etc., it's highly likely that it's just always going to be below 97%, which is why you want to use Outlook and GoDaddy. Okay. Uh, and so that's really all the kind of basics you need to know of deliverability. Uh, and to kind of end this video on a good note is really just staying updated. Okay. So like, this is one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you for cold email. Uh, and so like cold email is always changing. And so, you know, as we, as we wrap up this document and training, it's been a long one. Uh, I want to mention how important it is to stay updated on what's happening in the cold email space. You know, things are constantly changing and you need to have a good pulse on what's happening if you want to continue to get good results. And so for example, I saw a ton of agency owners who got screwed over by the Google domain Squarespace update due to deliverability dropping overnight. Uh, and this caused them to lose their major acquisition channel and getting new inboxes takes 14 days, right? So I saw a ton of people, as soon as Google bought Squarespace, they didn't really know about it until it happened and all their inboxes had terrible deliverability overnight. And that was one of their major acquisition channels. Now they have no meetings coming in uh, and, and so they're screwed and it takes at least another 14 days for them to get more inboxes on warm up minus ramp up. And so it's really gonna take them another 30 days just to get back to the sending volume that they had before, okay? But if they stayed updated on the latest cold email news, they would have already had new inboxes ready to send before that update even happened, okay? And so this is why it's so important to keep a good pulse on what's happening with cold email. It's constantly changing. I would say on average, there's some type of big update happening at least every 60 to 90 days. Um, and so you wanna keep a good pulse on what's happening. Again, like there's still people to this day that are watching old videos, trying to set up domains using Google and G Suite and they're gonna get terrible results because they're not tapped into the source, okay? And they're not staying updated. Um, and so Twitter is gonna be one of your best resources when it comes to getting cold email related info. Pretty much every lead gen, gen agency owner is on Twitter very actively. Um, and because of this, you know, you can get a pretty good pulse on what's happening in regards to cold email by going on Twitter. Uh, Instantly and Smart Leads Facebook groups are also going to be amazing resources for staying updated on what's happening. Uh, I recommend looking at these groups on a monthly basis to have a good idea on what's happening. Uh, and you can see cold email strategies that are working, maybe you haven't tried yet, etc. Uh, and then some of the best cold email related channels to follow are going to be Nick Abraham. He runs a lead gen agency with over a hundred clients. Uh, you know, Christian Bonnier, he's one of the cold email coaches at Client Ascension. Uh, Christian Placienza, hopefully I didn't butcher his last name. Uh, been on, on, on a consulting call with him. He's got a ton of great stuff on his channel around cold email. Daniel Fazio, one of the founders at Client Ascension. He basically invented cold email in this space. You might know him as cold email wizard. Matt Lucero, again, one of the coaches at Client Ascension. Uh, Instantly Smart Lead, they, they both have their own channels like any SaaS company that's trying to grow organically. Uh, and because of that, they post really good content on these channels, okay? Uh, specifically Smart Lead. Smart Lead doesn't have that many subscribers. They have a ton of great content on their channel, okay? Uh, and so if you wanna get deeper into cold email, I recommend checking out these channels and using them as a source to stay updated. Um, and so again, as cold email is changing, which we know it's going to be changing, you can stay equipped to, you know, understand and be prepared for those changes. Okay. Uh, and so, wow, I, I, I have, I, you know, I haven't looked at the recorder, but I have to say this video is probably more than three hours. I swear I did that all in pretty much one sitting besides pausing it once uh, to recharge the keyboard. So again, if you got value out of this, leave a like, subscribe, uh, and I would highly encourage you to get this document and use it as, it's basically a book because of how long it is, uh, and use it as a little cold email guide slash book. Uh, and so if you want that, it will be available below, uh, and hopefully you got value out of this video.